Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 502. Aaron Miller, the disc golf guy, alongside Johnny V. Yeah, it's gonna be one. it's gonna be a rainy night here in Milwaukee. I think we're gonna see it, but it's not raining winds, not like it is for our guests tonight. Mm, uh, like from the wind, like the wind casino. No, not W Y N N W I N Hannah Wynn. Han oh, Hannah, that's oh gosh, I, I was gonna try. <laughs> I got to spell that one. N G U Y N. Sure. All right. Well, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, a guy that's I'm gonna getting check it done. On that, by the way, a guy that is getting it done with ease, and I, I, everybody's I been waiting for it. I wouldn't say with ease. Well, I, every one make, of these is contested. He's starting to make it look easy as he continues to rack them up. Of course, we're talking about tonight's guest, Anthony Barella. AB, how you doing? How's it going? Am I'm I your biggest great. fan, or Woke is it the one that's above your head? Uh, I didn't even notice that, but <laughs> you're pretty big. It's a visual joke. Sorry. Uh, all right, AB. So let's get right to the very first thing. Uh, of course, congrats. But secondly, are you, you are you under some under the weather? Is too many celebrations? What's going on? Uh, we played uh, the course today, and I guess the allergies are just getting to me. I'm like sniffly, but I feel great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You, you sound as if uh, exactly that something's and I you. just woke up from a nap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, well, here we are. It's been a, a little more than 48 hours. How does it feel to have your third pro tour win under your belt for this season? How, how are you feeling 48 hours later? Um, I don't know. Like we celebrated Sunday night. Then we came out to Nashville and we went out last night and just hung out. And then now it's time to lock in. Music City Open starts in two days, and I want to win this one too. How do, Damn, how crazy. is the celebration different from Chess.com versus this one? Your first one, your first national or national tour, first Elite Series win versus your third Elite Series win. Is the celebration more subdued? Are they ramping up? Like by six wins, are we just going to see like two straight days of partying? I mean, how does that work for you? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I got to go home after chess.com and spend some time with my family and my girlfriend and my friends. So definitely celebrated that one a little bit more than this one. But the tournaments are just back to back now in the stretch of the season. So there's not a lot of time to celebrate. What does celebration in Jonesboro look like? Uh, literally just a crew of dudes just hanging out and <laughs> having fun okay okay there's uh, not really much to do there <laughs> well and that that's where i was thinking is you know i think about brooksville which uh is a very small area uh you know hour or so from tampa hour from orlando or more and i think of how tiny brooksville is and i think of uh this one as well uh here here we are I saw you in the press conference talking about the confidence and the monkey off your back and and what it's meant for you now we're at a, like a record breaking pace. I mean, what you've done has been phenomenal, but now we're officially like talking records. Last year, three wins was already in player of the year talk. Calvin had three wins and there was, and people were saying, oh, is it, is it Calvin or is it Isaac who has two majors? You're yeah. literally a win away from almost a lock for player of the year. Do you I think mean, about any I, of this? I'm just, I haven't really thought about that. I just, now that I've won these, I just want to win a major. And I think if I win one of the majors, it could, I don't know, anything could happen. You never know. Gannon could win every tournament here on Hell and then, <laughs> or someone else. But yeah, I'm not really too concerned about that right now. It's still early in the season. We got the whole year ahead of us. Uh, is there anything you can pinpoint this to? Like your successes, you've had three different courses, especially with chess.com being very different uh, from, say, Jonesboro, just in the way they play, the way the style but uh, of the shots that are required. But is there anything you can pinpoint some of this success to? Um, I would say like my backhand on like Anheuser releases has been like my staple. Like that's my most comfortable is just a slight turnover release right now. And the courses we played so far this year favor that shot pretty heavy. So it's just been, yeah, it's been like just my go-to. When we look back then, because I think of 
think it was your approach on 17 uh, specifically. But when I when you look back on this weekend, what shots really stand out in your mind is like, yeah, I I did that. Like what what jumps out at you that you're kind of most proud of? Uh, that putt on hole 14 was like the biggest putt I've ever made in my entire career, and it just was a feeling that I'm going to be chasing every single weekend. <laughs> Hole 14, did you, when you hit that putt, even at that point, did you think you had a chance to win it? Knowing what Ben Callaway was like a hole ahead of you, maybe maybe two at that point, hard to tell going back. And he, I mean, what were you thinking? Do you thinking, all right, this is it. I'm going to, I'm going to run this one. I'm going to, I'm going to birdie out and win. Or are you thinking, okay, Ben's maybe got this, or we're going to do a playoff if we're lucky. Yeah, I was. I thought that if I made that eagle putt and buried out, I would have won the tournament. I, that was just like my thought. I thought twenty four or twenty five under was going to be the score to win it, like with nine holes to play. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> what does it take for a mental reset? Because as you were at hole twelve, you were even for the round. I mean, just only yeah. two birdies, two bogeys to go on top of that to bring you at even. What are some of the things you're telling yourself as you're walking off 12 and then heading in to even hole 13? Um, I wasn't really thinking after hole 12. I, I was like, oh, I lost this tournament. Like, it's not – that drive just took – I just kind of, like, threw it. There wasn't really much to it. Put it close, made the putt, and then after hole 14, I was looking at the scores in the middle of the fairway, and then I think one of them parred and one of them birdied, and I – and I was like, all right, if I can just try to keep pace with Calvin and catch him, like, it's going to be close. And then when I lined up that putt on 14, I was, if I made that, I had that momentum. And that was going to be huge for me finishing out the round. How do you feel about, you know, one of the biggest storylines of the entire weekend certainly is the renumbering. Not not probably so much, you know, the the whole two redesign or the whole, you know, 10 change up, but just the actual reorder and the renumbering of the course. Uh, how do you feel like that personally impacted you uh, at all this weekend? Um, I think it was it definitely helped me out because that shot on hole 18 is like something I'm super comfortable with just powering a spike hyzer over there and i've put i've tried that shot plenty of times to where like the only thing that could really mess it up is if there's like a ripping left to right crosswind but that was never the case on that hole but i do miss finishing on old 18 that's one of the best par fours i think we play in the world mm -hmm. but i still think that new old 18 is a good finish and you can get the whole crowd down there and it's right in that area where there's a lot of electrifying things happen so I like the changes they did. Yeah, new hole 18, obviously, over the over the little creek, the OB everywhere. We saw uh, quite a few people go out of bounds on that shot. Kelvin went OB there. Ben Calloway went OB there, threw it out wide right. It's a different, it's got to be a different mentality going into that one versus the old 18, where we've seen Kelvin just demolish that hole on multiple occasions. Yeah. Like, he's, he's won it on that hole. Yeah. And even this weekend, we saw him throw... Maybe one of the best drives I have ever seen, much less on that particular hole. He put that thing like 600 feet up the fairway, it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> felt, on the old hole 18. So I, I bet you there's a different thought process, not just for you, A.B., but for Calvin, too, going into a hole where you're really comfortable versus going into that, you know, the, a, a little bit more of a touchy hole as far as OB goes. You know, it shouldn't be. It should be, like you said, a power hyzer. But we, we saw Calvin kind of clinch up a little bit and let go of it early. We saw Ben Calloway throw it way wide and you put it deep, but very safe and gave yourself a chance just to lay up for a three. <laughs> what what was going through your mind, uh, you know, when Ben released his, you know, he had a reaction. Calvin, you er audibly heard a reaction out of him. I don't know if he saw Ben. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you didn't. Never yeah, mind. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, never, I apologize. No, you didn't. Um, uh, well, then I'd, I'd ask the same of Kelvin, though. You see Kelvin, and we heard something out of him as well, though. What's going through your mind when you see that? Um, I was just thinking, like, in my head, I was just counting him to make that drop zone putt, and I was going to have that putt to <laughs> win the tournament. Okay. So I was thinking, like, all right, this one 35-footer is just in between me and a win, and then... <laughs> Once he missed the drop zone putt, I was like, okay, this is going to be a 
that's a huge relief because now I don't even have to make that putt and <laughs> worry about a roll away. Uh huh. But yeah. Cool. One, I don't, I don't know if it's a criticism, but someone posted today and said they're surprised there's not an OB deep line on on eighteen. Could you see them adding that? Do you would you encourage that? And, and I don't know at what what distance that is, but could you yeah. see them adding an OB deep line? Uh, I definitely could see it. I don't think it would change what I'm doing. I don't think mm-hmm. they can throw a hyzer far enough to where it would be a bad, bad enough shot to be OB. But, yeah, I don't think it would change much, honestly, for me. So. Uh, yeah, and granted, very few people, like you just said, uh, would have the power to not only get there, but then get, you know, at least you'd think they would put it at 50 or 60 or I longer. So. Yeah, You know, they can't bring it in too tight, clearly. But it, it shouldn't come into play. However, uh, it, it was just a thought that I saw out there and like, yeah, what if what if there was a little bit more touch that you needed in in terms of yeah. getting it over there? There's been some talk on all of your wins. It feels like there's been a pretty consistent thing. And that's cupcake on the bag. <laughs> Not at chess. No, he, what, what, yeah, he didn't, wasn't at chess, was he? Didn't he? Didn't he caddy no, for you? At, oh, I thought he caddied for you at the uh, end of chess.com. Oh, well, that throws the whole no. thing. I was gonna say, how does having him on the bag help? I mean, he, he, he's a player, he's a friend, he's, you know, what is the conversation between you and he like on the course? Is it strategy? Is it just someone just to sit and, you know, chat with? Like, what, how do you, how do you use Mr. Curtis? Yeah, we'll just like talk back and forth about like anything. Like, we'll just be talking. He likes to tell me a lot about what he does in the holes, which is like. <laughs> I don't really care. It's like whatever. That's but. the worst caddy. Honestly, everybody, nobody He's wants just, to hear what you ever do. Well, yeah, I'll throw, I hit the I'll band throw, like, and it rolled OB here. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'll throw like a shot and he's like, I threw one like 50 feet further. <laughs> and I honestly, I just look at him like, what are you doing, bro? Like I'm playing right now. But it fires me up and like that little back and forth banner just gets, keeps me relaxed, just feeling like a, just another casual round and then helps me with the nerves and stuff like that. And it's just nice to not have to carry your own bag. Yeah, uh, is <laughs> clearly it's not intentional. But when I I saw him on the bag in round two, I went out and looked to confirm that he was in fact playing. He had shot. I think he shot one under, one over that particular round. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it like somewhere deep down, are you kind of hoping that he kind of has a bad day so that he can be there and <laughs> be on your bag? I keep telling him, I was like, I don't even want you to caddy for me anymore in these tournaments. Like, you need to be playing while I'm playing. <laughs> but he's just getting his stride. It's his first year on tour. It's it's rough for everyone. It's tough out here, but we'll get it figured out. Yeah, it, uh, it it's great seeing him out there. And I, I know, you know, he struggled uh, in with his timing of an event, uh, you know, a couple of events ago <laughs> and everything else. But like you said... It seems to have worked out that he's out there and on the bag for you and, and helping you out. If yeah. he wasn't there, do you have uh, a second pick for someone that you would love on the bag? If they could be there, who, mean, who's your second pick? Or maybe your first pick um, over him. <laughs> probably, I would like to have my girlfriend, but she doesn't carry the <clears throat> she doesn't carry the bag. She just like walks there. But mm-hmm. if I can't have them, then probably my dad. I like okay. when he for me. All right. Okay. That makes sense. I right, like is, that. Is uh, Mr. Macbeth allowed on the bag at all? I mean, we saw what happened last time he was there. Not anymore. <laughs> no. Never again. He's out. Just so kidding. that kind He's of fired. That kind of brings me to my next question. We always hear about <sighs> players that have to go through struggles. I mean, Doss talks about it a lot. You know, you have to earn your stripes on tour. Do you think that's true? I mean, after we saw what happened at European Open, then you coming out here, do you think they're related would you be where you're at if you didn't have that hurdle or do you think that is just a hurdle i mean pretend you never went over to europe do you think you're having this season uh no honestly i think that was like the i don't know i think that was like the pinnacle and my i needed that to happen to propel me to the next step forward and it just makes it for a better story too like having that happen and then coming out and winning tournaments but yeah, I think I think that plays into a huge part of who I am today. Good. Oh, a major, of course, these have been these uh, incredible Elite Series wins. You were that close, as we just talked about the major. Do, do you care 
what major it is. I mean, we have one in, you know, about 10 days or so, but yeah. any major, are they all the same to you or you just want one this year or is I want, there one? I really, yeah, yeah, I want to win European Open, honestly, like more than any tournament. I just, it's just such a crazy feeling to be out there with all those people watching and then on such a prestigious course. And I just think that would be the greatest feeling ever if I could win that tournament. And ultimately, the sweetest revenge, uh, probably yeah. in some sense as well. Does that does that wrap up his uh, his Disney story? Like you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. he comes back the next year, takes <sighs> after winning all season. Or yeah, that's that's true. I mean, that's a that's a documentary in itself. So here you are getting more comfortable with the winner's circle. Clearly, you know, playing some incredible golf. At what point are you still nervous? When, when is that? At any point in this weekend, name a few times where you you felt legitimate nerves. Um, definitely the first, the front nine of that final round, I was pretty nervous. Is like, it, it was like the this was the first elite series that felt like real because it's on like a course I've played so many times. I think I've been here like four or five times, and it's just like so much history at the property and that plays into a huge role for like nerves and stuff like that. Cause I've been watching it since I was what 2016, I think it was the first year Jonesboro was a tournament. So I've just, I've been watching the tournament every year it's happened and just being there in the moment, it felt real. And then after that put on 14, I kind of like lost all the nerves and that was just pure confidence and motivation from then on. You, and maybe that's a follow up. You haven't traditionally played well at that property. Is that is that a fair statement? I don't. I don't even know. I for, I don't know what place I got last year. I feel like tw- I know twentieth yeah, or twenty fifth. I think it's a fair statement that you have not done well there the couple times you've played. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Yeah, now, now, now I, uh, I want to go look. I, I remember that was some blurb somewhere within our kind of pre-production meeting is seeing that uh, I, I think 20th is the best that you had finished there. What, what was it maybe in prior years then? You know, as you said, they're, they're almost, you can't even remember. What do you feel like the difference was in prior, year, prior years when you didn't find success? Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm a completely new player. It's like, Stepping out on these courses is like I have a whole new mindset and repertoire, I feel like, in my game to where I can birdie any hole. And it just like I haven't had that confidence in the past. And I think that's a huge difference between me this year and last year. Is that a lot of practice this off season? I mean, is that what, what it comes down to is just the putting the actually putting the reps in? Yeah, and then after chess talk like I didn't even go into chess talk, I'm thinking I was gonna win the tournament, but after it happened, it's like, it's like now at every tournament I'm going into it, I'm thinking like, oh, I want to win this. I can do this again and again. It's just like crazy. It's just crazy how that one win can just completely change my entire mindset for this game. Well, even comparing whether it's last year or pre-chess.com, whatever the case might be, whenever, whatever time you want to use it, uh, go back to what what do you feel like is the, the biggest thing you've fixed or adjust physically? You, you just talked about confidence and, and now you can build on that, but physically uh, on the course, like what are any of the changes you've implemented? Style, technique, form, whatever, anything? Um, honestly, no, I feel like I still have the same putting form as last year. And then my drives look the same. My sidearms is just all mental. I, I did a lot of weight training in the off season trying to get stronger and then like some speed and agility stuff just to be healthier. And then I don't know, I just feel a lot better and a lot more confident in myself this year. You, you roll with um, a, a lot of our touring pros and, and I guess I'm, I'm specifically thinking of time spent in Arizona, uh, the likes of Parker Welk, who's out there, obviously Ricky Wysocki cupcake was over in Arizona yeah. a handful of times, all of these different people, Ezra, uh, uh, Gossage, like Gossage. all these people are Gossage around there. more often. Yeah, um, uh, yeah Jake Brown, uh, all these people. Mm-hmm. Do you guys feel like, Do you, maybe do you feel like you're learning 
or feeding off of each other any differently now compared to maybe five years ago? Uh, yeah, for sure. There's like every single day we could play, go play a practice round and like play against a real touring pro. Like me and Ricky played countless rounds together this off season. Like we'd go like every day for like a week straight and just go play each other for like twenty hundred dollars and just simulate that pressure. And I think that constant like feeling of pressure and like wanting to win every day and like the off season definitely helped propel me forward with this mentality. <laughs> Be honest. Does Ricky try to pay you in Bitcoin <laughs> <No>. <laughs> when you win? <laughs> it's like, bro, no, no I could give, uh, but hey, uh, pull out your wallet. Uh, We're going to yeah. get some. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a digital wallet. Uh, now that kind of leads me to my question, which is let's just make up a number and say you guys played uh, 50 competitive rounds with something on the line this off season. Let, that's just my number I'm going to round to. If it was 50, what was what was the record between the two of you out of fifty competitive rounds between you and Rick? I have no idea. It's honestly what? probably pretty even. Okay, I mean it wasn't <laughs> yeah lopsided at all. You're saying no, it was pretty even. I, yeah, twenty five and twenty five. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, yeah, you guys were pretty much right up. Now last week we had a discussion, and so has the rest of the internet about specifically a lot of dumb things. But one was rivalry the the sportsmanship the gamesmanship between some of our players johnny here for instance was suggesting that we see a little more tenacity maybe a little bit more ferociousness and maybe just a little more angst uh, or or battle like well, I, I basically my my take was that the sport seemed a little i don't say more interesting but there was more excitement when we had like paul versus ricky and yeah. I said, right now, our two top players are Anthony Barella and Gannon Burr. But there, and there doesn't seem to be any of that chippiness. There's no, you know, it's all friendly. We saw on Gannon Burr congratulate you on social media, and it's very friendly. Yeah. And I said, I, I would like to see, and maybe it's not you two, maybe it's two other people, but I'm picking the two guys right now that are dominating our sport. I would love to see more competitive fire between the two of you. Ooh, a little less friendliness, a little like, mm. I, I think that could bring more i don't say more fun but it just it might bring more interest to different people inside so do you do you feel like a, a, a competitive rivalry is a good thing or would you do you like it being more chummy uh i think having a rivalry would be good for everything like good for the sport it'd be interesting so i don't know it might might start talking some crap about him. There you go. We'll see <laughs> I, and that's kind of what i said is i feel like there almost has to be a situation where somebody is somewhat dickish to the other person in some capacity on or off the course. Yeah. And I feel like that's how we would break through this, this, you know, friendly bro mentality into like, Hey, I, th I think I kind of dislike you and I do really want to beat you. So, I mean, do you want to throw any shots or, or yeah. uh, take any shots right now and start talking some shit or <laughs> like, cause we're here for it. it. I don't have anything to say right now, but we'll see. I'll see him this week and, We'll start. We'll start a little bit thing. We'll there see. you go. <laughs> Get a little chippy on social media. Start with social media, yeah. and then you know, work your way up, and finally, you know, like, did you guys see Gannon's shoes this week? I mean, <laughs> what was that clown doing, or whatever? I mean, you got to start. Like, if you're going to start ripping on him, where where do you think you're going to start? With what? With what? I have no idea where to even start. Oh, I think I think you I think you start making fun of his logo, like. It's just a knockoff AB logo, but it's like upside down. Oops, whatever. Okay, Gannon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'll think of something. Uh, uh, this brings up another question because I love how uh, social media works. Um, my question is, someone suggested or, or flat out, I think, outright claimed that you hate the nickname AB. What? See? The, People don't know what the hell they're talking about. I I know. But I, I, I figured like I would the, go I ahead like and get it on record. Do, do you in any way second guess anyone calling you AB? No, never. My parents have been calling me AB since I was like three years old. So it's just like, it's just like someone says AB. I think they're talking to me like every time. So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have any hate at all towards that. But some of my buddies like to call me Tony and I, 
that just doesn't seem right to me. But <laughs> yeah, I think Gossage, uh, seemingly, at least from when I've been around <laughs> you guys, it feels like Gossage really uh, uh, kind of has latched yeah, onto that likes, more than he anyone. He likes to call me Tony. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds so damn weird I, I, when I'm in the room and he says that. I'm like, what is? <laughs> well, I mean, I, we all have different nicknames for different people. Like my family calls me, they call me John John. They've called me it forever since I was a tiny little baby. And to this day, everyone, in, when we go to family hangouts, everyone calls me that. JV, Johnny V, like a thousand nicknames. Terry, T-Bear, T-Bear. Yeah. Like everybody kind of has, click, you know, little things. I don't know. Okay, well, I just I wanted to put it out there because, you know, it's the internet, and I just remember thinking how stupid it really sounded. I'm, I'm going to make a point next time yeah, you guys ridiculous. play together online, you and uh, Gossage, and we're going to have we're going to have Tony and <laughs> it'll be Tony Tony Barella and what's one for Aaron? I don't know. You just Goss. call him Goss all the time, don't you? Goss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does all he right. like that? <laughs> I don't know. He, everyone was calling him Goose, and I was like, I, I'm just going to call you Goss because it <laughs> yes. just sounds funnier. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Mo about that. We'll get that <laughs> happening on the broadcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, obviously, a long stretch. You know, you said you went home after chess.com. Here we are. You know, I know you had kind of officially off the weekend of uh, when the U.S. women's was happening. Um, but now, you know, three straight weekends leading you right into Northwood Black and the Champions <sighs> Cup. When when is your next break? What what do these next few weekends look like for you? Um yeah, I'm playing Music City, then straight to Champions Cup, and then straight to DDO, and then we have a week off. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'll be going back to Arizona. Then we're going to the West Coast swing after that. Okay, so pretty much that one week. There's you know there's a, a yeah. 303. That's a Q series. There's a the Las Vegas Challenge. You know there's a couple other events, but not from the Pro Tour perspective. And then ultimately you get out there yeah. for OTB and you're ready to go again. So that one week off. And you're registered for Vegas. You're you plan on playing that? Oh. I am registered. I don't I don't know if I'm going to play yet. Okay. Right. Yeah, because then you don't get your week off. I know that's <laughs> what I was thinking. I was you said the week off, and I looked, and I'm like, well, maybe there's something we don't know, yeah, or maybe. <laughs> Yeah, a newer thing. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, this guy's making too much money. He doesn't need to show up to these non <laughs> these non pro tour events uh, anymore Did, for a four day event. Like that's that's a that's a big commitment. I yeah, mean, that's a lot for an mm -hmm. A tier. But it is in Vegas though, and Vegas is pretty fun. Yeah, so I heard. <laughs> that's the rumor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll we'll sidebar for a moment then. You know, I've seen you in uh, in uh, the Peoria area and a few of the other places. Where where is name some of your favorite locations that aren't necessarily based on the play? Some of the places you love to visit. Are... Um, yeah, Peoria is one of my favorite stops on tour because one of my best friends in Arizona is actually born and raised in Peoria. Mm -hmm. So we always get a crew of like ten guys to go stay in his grandpa's basement, and we're just there all week and. Yeah, it's a blast. And then Maple Hill, I love hanging out there because the Economoses have the mm. tiki course, the 18-hole putting course, and that's mm -hmm. like, I love that. And we're usually there like every night. And then those are like the two I'm thinking of like off the top of my head, but I know there's more stuff and more like traditional or traditions we do like at, at multiple stops. Oh, Idlewild also. Oh, yeah, we have yeah. some great hosts. That Idlewild do really take care of us. And you over at the Arling House, really Arling House House, or are you somewhere else over there? No, it's uh, Mark and Don. They okay. actually, we were supposed to stay at the Arling Houses originally like four years ago, but they just had too much, or they didn't have enough room for us. So Mark and Don <laughs> took us in, and they've just been great. Awesome. That 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 is so much of what I think makes the tour life uh, so much more fun is these these places you visit time and time again, and then these incredible hosts yeah. that you're ultimately introduced to, and then you become lifelong uh, friends with. I, th I think that's awesome and incredible. Yeah. Now, uh, a few minutes ago, we you, you briefly mentioned how uh, sometimes your girlfriend has been on the bag or, well, is in, with, the, in the support role. Yeah. Is, there, is there a world where she's on tour with you in a greater capacity, or is she possibly going to take some extended trips with you? How, how does that look for the rest of the year, and what are her obligations? Uh, yeah, she'll definitely come out for Worlds and USDGC. Okay. But with her job, she doesn't really get much time off, so she hopefully we can just get her out there whenever she has some free time. Okay. 
I'm sure she wouldn't mind that Europe trip. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> when um, when you do like unwind when you when you turn off disc golf and you're not putting in in someone's backyard and you're not you know doing anything disc golf related what are a few of your favorite off course activities that you're doing with your buddies um i love playing pickup basketball and then i i really like enjoy fingerboarding it's just super fun to me um i've been playing tennis a lot recently Hmm. so that's like but other than that stuff, it's just like watching YouTube videos of disc golf, and then all my friends back home love disc golf. So whenever they have free time, they want to play. And yeah, it's just like there's not really moments during the day where it's like not about disc golf these days. It's like crazy. I think it's funny that you mentioned tennis and not pickleball. Uh, which, that was going to be my follow up, which it's is like, what everybody on tour right now is obsessed with. Yeah. And you're, you, Ooh, you, oh, okay. Here's where here's where it starts. Are you talking trash about all these <laughs> these pickleballers that are out there? They're old guys. <laughs> no, it's I played a lot of pickleball too, but I don't know. It's just like the light the light racket was like kind of starting to hurt my elbows. So I was like, this oh. is like I'm just going to stop playing. But the heavier tennis racket, I don't know, it just feels more natural, and it's it's a lot more fun, honestly. Okay. Um, if you weren't, if disc golf, and I know this is a really crazy hypothetical, but if disc golf wasn't your life and your career and your passion, what are some of the other things that you think you might have, let's just assume you never found disc golf. What else do you feel like you would have aligned yourself with athletically growing up? Uh, definitely baseball. I would have, I would have tried to make it to the MLB if I had never found disc golf. Uh, he's got, he's got, he's already. Got, I mean, you've already got the MLB jersey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it just, it just works out for you. What, um, what is it about baseball? Um, in terms of the game and the intrigue and everything else, what specifically is it about baseball? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just been like. Before I can even remember, I've just always been playing like organized baseball leagues and stuff like that growing up, and then it just like became like an everyday thing for me, like disc golf, and I just love baseball. I love to watch it and I love to play it. And it was just finding that passion, and when that passion switched from baseball to disc golf, I was just a hundred percent in for disc golf. So and what- when was that? Oh, sorry. No, you're good. Um, it was probably when I was. 16 i broke my arm at a trampoline park my left arm Mm. and so i was like all right like i can't play baseball this season and then that was like the turning point where i was like okay like it's time to start focusing on disc golf because i could throw with like my sling on and stuff and that was the switch where i never went back to baseball and just started playing disc golf i was gonna say what position in baseball were you primarily were you a pitcher or somewhere else yeah i was a pitcher okay that's I think it makes the most sense for a lot of our players, it feels like, but, you know. Yeah. So this, we, we've got uh, Music City coming up. What's it going to take mm-hmm. for you to win Music City? Like, looking at that course, what are the skills required for Music City that you feel are, are, are important in order for you to win? Um, last year at this tournament, I felt like it was just like about power, but this year with the changes they've made, I just played a practice on there. It's like a lot of placement shots now. So it's just being accurate. And if the wind gets up about committing to your shots and a problem I've been having recently is like early release and just not committing. And if I think, I think if I commit to every single shot this week and just bring that confidence and drill all my circle wind putts, I should be at least able to put myself in contention. You know, as you said, you just did a practice round, and that makes me think about you, your buddies, and then also some of the videos that you've been putting out. Give a pull back the curtain a little bit to your YouTube growing and your career, and 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 maybe even what you you feel like you're truly trying to accomplish there. Uh, yeah, YouTube is just. I, I think it's just really fun to make videos and like edit them, and have all of my friends in it, and like it helps them out. And it helps me out, grow our brands. And I don't know. It's just like a. have always enjoyed like making YouTube videos like that. Like I used to try to make videos when I was a kid. But 
you'll never find those but <laughs> you know, been like, are they out there are, yeah, well here's the question are they able to be found like are they are they somewhere no. out there or private you, or did have you delete you, them have you gotten rid of them i deleted them all yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah it's just like i think it's fun and i enjoy doing it do you have a uh, like an end goal? I mean, we, you could be, and I say that because you see, obviously, what a Simon has done, and you've seen Yuli, and you've seen Drew, and you've seen so many of these others, Alden Harris. You see all these different styles, and everybody have their kind of different take on it. Do you feel like you have like an ultimately a goal in any capacity? Um, I don't know. Like a goal is like. I want people to just know like me better, I guess, and just mm -hmm. get my personality out there more. And I think those YouTube videos really show who I am as a person and just what it's like to kind of like hang around like disc golfers when they're just playing like a casual round. And I think that stuff's cool. And I've, I've always looked for content like that in the disc golf world. But you now I can just create my own and I just have a blast doing it. Do you have a favorite disc golf YouTuber? Like whose videos when you when they come out you're like oh sweet there's a this person video. Um, I like the disc golf world. Their videos are super. They're like straight to the point and they're quick and yeah, I just love watching them. I think what those guys are doing is great. Okay. Oh, uh, you talked about building your brand. We've seen th obviously three wins, five events. Um, have you noticed a change in we'll say? the social media that comes from your first win versus your most recent win at Jonesboro. Like, was there a big flow for that first win? Congratulations. Got that monkey off your back versus the third one. Or do you feel like you're now building a fan base that, you know, if, if we get to six wins, it's going to be two days of alerts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't really know. It's just the, my test.com posts. I got like 11,000 likes and that's like the most I've ever gotten. <laughs> And I think I gained a lot of fans after that tournament, and it's just about maintaining them now. Like, they're all out here, and my fans want me to win every week, but that's going to be really tough. It's a lot of talent out there. But, yeah, social media, it's definitely been growing, and, yeah, I'm gaining followers like crazy. It's unreal. Does that then, and maybe you can or can't share, does that turn into sales for you? Like, is Discraft calling you up right now and be like, Bro, we gotta burn more of these discs. Let's go, let's go. Like, do you do you see a, a big influx of Anthony Barella gear being sold out of? I don't, I don't have have they released the new? I don't know if Discraft has done. Yeah, they've got their they've got their tour series yeah, out. Yeah, you're yeah, you're old. That's old news. Bro. Okay, yeah, right. I, I I couldn't remember, but I know they also have specific pages for each player with updates. I mean, yeah. are you are you seeing a lot of that transfer into uh, Anthony Barella gear out there? Yeah, for sure. Like after I won chess.com, I went to all the tournaments, Waco, Austin, and like there's always just people wearing my jerseys and it's like a, it's the craziest feeling. I always try to go up there and give them knuckles and tell them I appreciate them for supporting me. And yeah, I've seen a lot more AB hats and AB jerseys and it's just a, it's a dream come true. Have you signed any jerseys? Yes. Good. Yeah. Because I, I, you're talking about baseball, and I always just imagine a baseball player who signs the back of their jersey, right by their name for their fans. And I think it's kind of yeah. cool. That would be kind of cool to have the AB, and maybe maybe it's already this way, the AB jersey customizable with your own name on the back, like we can Ooh. like we can see with baseball players. I mean, I could get a number seven or fifteen with my name on it. I, I would, would like the cool. AB jersey maybe with my own name on it. <laughs> that, could be fun. that would be cool. I don't. Yeah, that seems like a lot of work. I don't I know. Seem, yeah, work. I was just going to say, I'm going to well, check my embroidery press. Tonight. Yeah, that's what we got. Those will be out tomorrow. <laughs> Listen, a, a few more wins, Anthony, and you can ask for anything you want. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> that that leads me to a, a, a question in this realm, which is, where are you with your Discraft contract? As in, is it is it up at the end of 2024? Well, where where are you within your contract right now? Yeah, it's a, it'll be up this year. So this okay. is my last year on the contract. <laughs> How convenient. Yeah. Show me the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's got to feel pretty good knowing, obviously, you've already had these accomplishments this year. You're looking to just build on those and stack on top mm -hmm. of it. But not any year's a good year to have a breakout season and this incredible start, but a contract yeah. season year is even better. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not super concerned with that right now. I'm sure. really 
just locked in with the season and just trying to play my best. Awesome. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that till like October. Yeah, wait, wait for October. Yeah, yeah when you got two or three majors under your belt, and then you're like, eh, show me that. <laughs> oh, that would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. Uh, awesome. Uh, we know you have other obligations. We certainly want to respect those, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So before we let you go. Uh, first of all, give us give us how people can and should follow you, and in ways that they can support you and your sponsors, all that stuff. Give us give us the full spiel. Yeah, my Instagram is Anthony Barella one one, so you can follow me there. And then my YouTube, I think it's just if you type in Anthony Barella, you should be able to find it. And then TeamDiscraft.com if you want to buy a jersey, they're restocking on Friday, I believe. So you should be able to get. I think all of them will be available now. But, yeah, that's how you can support me. Go grab a Tour Series disc, Venom. Okay. Uh, and then is there uh, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you'd love to throw out into the to the ether there? Anything else that we didn't ask you about or anything else you want to share or talk about? Uh, yeah. Um, you were there, you were there, Terry, when I won 2015 AM Worlds. Where were you this year? Ah, uh, <laughs> that's true. I was, I was in the booth, and just like I told you for chess dot com, there uh, with so many of you players, you of course included. Like I've seen almost all of your biggest moments, um, yeah. in person or through my video lens, or this time you know live, but still watching and to to see you win Am Worlds, to see you go runner up at Am Worlds first, and and just everything that you've done. And then to see you a year later, except your first ever cash in, in Maricopa and yeah. you were still like only my height roughly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been incredible. And, and you know, it's, it's not a secret that it, it's been awesome seeing you grow and thrive as a player and as a professional, but then also as a human. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely super proud of you. I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm your dad's age, so I think it's fair to say that. Uh, it's uh, it's been this unbelievable journey, and I'm not unique when I say it wasn't a matter of if you would win tournaments; it was just a matter of when. And so to see that coming through the way it has been this year, uh, it just makes me that much happier. So uh, it, it's been an awesome journey, and I appreciate your openness and your your candidness throughout all these years too. To know that. Anytime yeah. I've ever asked you for a favor or have a conversation, you've been nothing but gracious and kind, and uh, it makes it that much easier to root for you week in and week out. So I, I appreciate that, and uh, congratulations yeah, on everything. I appreciate you too, Terry. I don't think I could be here if you weren't back there in 2015 filming these tournaments and just really grinding. People don't give you your flowers, but you deserve it more than anyone, I think, in the video world. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. I got goosebumps, man. I, and you got uh, flowers already yeah, on your yeah, over your shirt. I'm just wearing so. flowers. No, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. I've you know, uh, Simon Lazat said something similar of that you know five or eight years ago in a, in a moment, and uh, I do it because I love the game. But part of this journey has been seeing you and the growth of our superstars. And uh, like I said, I, I. I don't take it lightly that I've seen so many of these moments, yeah. whether it's from you, Paul's young career, Ricky's young career, Paige Pierce's career. I think I've been there for like 85% uh -huh. of her major wins. Um, it's It's been incredible to see this journey. Old. Yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> it's been incredible, man. And uh, nothing but love and respect. And, and I see your family and what your family means yeah. and what your family brings week in and week out as well to your support network. And it's been um, it's been just awesome to see, and uh, we're right there in your corner as well. So I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, you know you're welcome here anytime. You don't have to win, uh, even though it seems like a, a habit for you. But you're welcome anytime. Doesn't seem like he's stopping. And uh, anytime you want anything to uh, share or to drop in with us, we're always here. And uh, I look forward to the next time yeah. I see you on the course. It might be in a couple of weeks at uh, DDO, probably. Maybe we'll okay, go to the Bourbon perfect. Cowboy. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. That's right, Anthony well, Barella, yeah, a three-time ch champion on the Pro Tour this weekend. Uh, congratulations as he takes down jo Jonesboro. Have a good one, and good luck at Music City this weekend, buddy. Thanks, guys. All Thanks. right, see ya. A.B., your Jonesboro champion, 
three out of five events. That, that is amazing. Yeah. Nobody predicted a season to start like the pro tour in general to start like this. I mean, if you would have told, asked anybody, is anyone winning three of the first five events? Everyone would think you're crazy. It was like, no, there's no way. No one's winning three. Some people would be like, well, Kristen's probably got the best chance. Okay. In F, in <laughs> That's F, what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, nobody's saying that on the MPO side. And even Kristen hasn't been able to accomplish that on the FPO nope. side as good as she is. It's It's been this insane season. And mm -hmm. to, to see AB besting these fields on, on different courses in, in different states in different yeah. ways has been nothing short of incredible. I know. I think really the only thing that we can that people are looking for now out of him is to see if he can do it in a heavily wooded course. Sure. Which, and which Champions it, Cup is going to do just a, that. A hundred percent. I mean, we're going to see if he can maintain this phenomenal start through a very densely wooded course. And that can get even your best players, your Isaac Robinson, who's kind of known as, you know, a very pure thrower. Yeah. Technician. Uh, he, Northwood Black will break people. And it... it <clears throat> I could see a I could see a B winning. I could see uh, Isaac Robinson winning. Gannon Burr, anyone out there has the capability. It's just whether we can see Anthony Barella kind of keep up. Or even if he takes like a top three, I think he'll he'll prove any of the doubters wrong that say that you know he's more of a power thrower and not so much of an accuracy. Blah blah blah. So. Well, I think I think watching him get be so continue to be so comfortable with the mids and with the putter. Yeah. That that is such an equalizer because then when you're out on a course like Northwood Black, sure there might be uh an alley to hit, but when he's that comfortable with again that mid or that putter, it is uh, just such an advantage when <laughs> some other people have to power up, he's able to lean into the power but go with something more controllable and then hopefully get a uh, you know better result. So yeah, that's uh, exciting. First, obviously, his sights are set on Music City this weekend, and he's looking to dethrone one Simon Lazat. Simon, who had uh, certainly some flashes of greatness this weekend as well in Jonesboro. And with that, why don't you read off our uh, our top 10 players or so on the MPO side? Copy that, Terry. As we said, Anthony Barella, your champion, 24 under par, wins this one on the final hole, more or less. Uh, he He didn't have to birdie it. Luckily, um, Ezra Aderhold comes in second, tied with Ben Calloway. Ben, my heart goes out to Ben because I truly thought we were going to go see some extra holes. And I thought Ben had a really good chance at winning this. And then those last two holes just really bit him. He, he, he skipped just a little late on 17, slid into the OB, and then on 18, just flat out shanked it. Just threw it way wide. It just, I don't know if it was a, a, a uh, a nerves thing, a misplay of the wind, just missed his angle on the throw. Ben's a very, uh, one of our best throwers off the tee. So to see him do it, do that was actually a little bit of a surprise to me. But ultimately, there's, you know, y you can't argue too much with a tie for second with Ezra Aderhold and Calvin Heimberg. So as, you know, Calvin coming back to Jonesboro and continuing his streak of top two over the last, what, five years now? This is the fifth year in a row he's taken top two. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to Calvin, who, again, had a chance to at least push it into extra ones, maybe even, uh, depending on how it looked, a chance to win, depending on how that final hole goes, that 35-foot putt from that AB was going to have to hit. It, it's not a gimme. It, it's it's what we like to call a knee knocker a little bit, but uh, he probably would have hit it. We would have seen some extra holes. In fifth place, as you said, Simon Lazat, finally kind of coming out of the season. He hasn't had a really great start to the season, but... This course, I think, really plays to a lot of his strengths. It's, there wasn't, Jonesboro, there's not a lot of danger to get into. As long as you keep- Most it, of the holes. Most of the holes. <laughs> you're right. I mean, most you're, of the holes, right, it, it, it's, it's just a straight on fairway. Like, hit this fairway, Heiser, Anheuser, whatever you need to do. It's not like you you need to carve lines. And I feel like while well, Simon can carve lines, this type of course really is beneficial for Simon, um, unless he's throwing 600 feet in the air and only 50 feet in front of him. That's those are tough ones, <laughs> yeah. as we saw him do on on uh, one of the holes out there on that final round. Sixth place, another uh, player we haven't talked much about, but it kind of goes to the course. Uh, Albert Tom, 
shooting 21 under par. So only our top six players are separated by three strokes. Uh, in seventh place, a tie with Chris Dickerson, Gavin Babcock, and Gannon Burr. And then a two-way tie for 10th place, Mason Ford, who's, as we mentioned, I think two weeks ago, a really good start to this season for Mason Ford. Just very consistently in that top 10. At one point, usually in the conversation, um, he wasn't really in the conversation to win this week going into the final round, but man, just a good season to start with. And then as we talked about as well, Isaac Robinson, who this would not be a course you would normally pick Isaac Robinson on because it is more of a power thrower course. And while he's not shy with distance, as none of our top players are, it's not what people think about for him, as well as there's a few spots out here where a forehand doesn't hurt on a few of the approaches and such. And Isaac, while he can throw a forehand, again, not known for his strength, but a top 10 for Isaac Robinson, get, getting maybe that slow start behind him for some of these upcoming events. We're going to move over to FPO now. We're going to talk about Kristen Tatar, who won this after the first round, basically. <laughs> I think uh, the, after the, her after the third round, she shook hands and said, thanks for showing up for rounds two and three, ladies. Uh, just... She came out with a, a, a 1044 rated first round. The next closest was a 999. I'm sorry, 999. 999, yeah, I was right the first time. 999. So she bested 50 points. 50 point rating swing. 45. Just six strokes. Yeah. I mean, and at that point, I think everyone knew, as we said, Jonesboro isn't the type of course where you're usually getting into a ton of trouble. Uh, no, uh, like the, 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 the wind, the wind tried to do what it could correct. for all of our players this weekend. And it certainly wreaked havoc on a number of throws. Yeah. And then the side slopes and, and the baskets Roll on aways. the hills also are looming. I, when we did the quick math, there are just two holes that have flat, <laughs> flat greens Two, only two where you're almost for sure not going to roll away. And obviously, the things can still happen there. But there's only two flat greens out of 18 on that course. So every single putt has the chance, some holes more than others, of course, but every single chance, every single putt has the chance to hit a basket or underneath the basket and then get up and roll away 20, 30, 50, 100 feet. Only two flat. Um, well, And that's... One of the advantages, not that she took this advantage, but one of the advantages of being out so far ahead, you don't have to run at those if you don't want to. Yeah. And granted, she still did, but and she usually hit them. The players that are usually picking up and rolling aren't the ones who are laying up. They're the ones who are hitting basket, the disc is hitting the ground, and it's rolling. Sometimes that's off the tee if you're Calvin. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. it's a, sometimes it's from the putts. So Kristen Tatar was just in control the entire tournament. Um, Second place, Holland Hanley coming out with a 13 under par. That's a nine stroke difference between her and KT. Um, third place, Evelina Salonen at 12 under. Then there was a little drop. Fourth place, Maria Oliva, who a, a name we haven't really spoken about when it comes to the leaderboard this year. I know we talked a little bit about her socials and some of the issues she was having earlier in the season, but in fifth place, a three way tie between Eli Ezra Midling. Heide Leine and Luke Lorenzen. So Lorenzen, 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 Luke Lorenzen. Um, Eliezer, uh, <laughs> I keep harping on this. Going back to the course, this is a perfect course for Eliezer, a powers, a power thrower's course, and that's what she is. You know, she's she's young. She's still working on getting some of those uh, touch shots that we talked about with AB. Where, you know, finding that good mid-range, finding that putter shot, Eliezra is 100 miles an hour, and this course suits that. It, it doesn't, you know, it, it's not going to get you a win probably, but it gets you into the top 10. So Eliezra in fifth place, taking home $1,240. Eighth place, Rebecca Cox, who again has had a kind of a quiet but good start to the season. Ninth place, Stacey Kiefer. And a three-way tie for 10th place, Own Scoggins. Haley King and Silva Saarinen. So, uh, Owen Scoggins having maybe an off season or not off season. Off sorry, season. You know, a little off season. You know, she dropped whatever. She hasn't got. She only got one win this year. Jeez, no, uh, uh, an off weekend. Just kind of 
you know, losing to Kristen Tatar by 19 strokes just doesn't feel very own like. But again, you might maybe rack that up to the course a little bit. She had a really rough first round. It could have been some of the wind. It's just anything could just be an off weekend for her. I mean, you, there's she could come out this weekend at uh, and 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 win, and no one would be shocked. So that's that's kind of own sky. And it's really we'll get into this a little bit more, but it was really difficult to find out why she was having struggles when she wasn't getting any stats on her card. Yeah, and I, one of the things that jumps out is, you know, you're thinking about Onskagen's literally the weekend before going into the final round uh, in Arkansas tied with Kristen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so s- seemingly things are fine in that sense. So whatever the case was specifically for Own uh, probably is a little bit of, a, of, of an anomaly because obviously you look at her rating, you look at where she's been playing this year, the consistency that she's had in all sorts of different courses. And it was a very out of the ordinary weekend and experience for Owen Scoggins out on the course. Like that's, there's, that's all you can say about it in that sense. Like it, it's, I mean, there's no other sugar coating it in mm-hmm. terms of she had an off weekend. Now to what specifically we can pinpoint that to that I'm not sure of. Uh, but it was also no surprise that as soon as she was done with her round, she came back, came back to the card who was on hole 14 uh, playing over the water. You saw her join. I. It was so funny. I even said it, I think, on the broadcast. Uh, there was a shot, and then I heard some applause of sorts or some kind of uh, jubilation. And I thought, that sounds like Own. And then sure, sure enough, like a minute later, we saw her in frame. I'm like, okay, yeah, Own's <laughs> out there. And that means she came back after her round to see how it was going uh, down on the rest of the card. A little surprising when... You know, not, not that she's the type to get upset and leave the course, but she is the type to be the first one to try to get to the next event. <laughs> yeah, and I even made that reference, thinking that maybe uh, she would be done, definitely not finishing on the podium in that sense. And then I thought, wow, she's she's the type that would would try and get the three or five hours over to uh, Northwood Black and get half a round in. Like she would play nine or eighteen mm-hmm. holes or as many holes as time would allow. And then drive Northwood. to Music City, and that's where I got <laughs> I myself twisted around. It's like, oh no, no, no. they they do still have a tournament before the, you know this major. So, but then I thought, yeah, she just the same would drive over to uh, to drive over to Nashville and try and get a round in. Like that's yeah. she's done that more than once. That on a Sunday she'll drive already get to the next course to then try and get holes in already on a, on Sunday night. So. Uh, it didn't appear to be the case from what we could tell. We know she stuck around for a little while at least. Yeah, so I mean, that's she's in good spirits. <laughs> Clearly, there's nothing physically wrong with her. Just as someone said, sometimes you have an off week. Uh, exactly, and that, that just speaks to the how high she's raised her own floor or raised her own bar in that we just expect to see her in the top three mm-hmm. you know, or contending for a win just about every single weekend here. I mean, she is, what, the second highest rated player in the entire division, so it... it when you're not in the top three or top five uh, with the dominance she has showed in the past, it does uh, surprise a few of us. So um, good to see uh, that uh, seemingly everything's all right. Uh, real quick, I know we, we, you know, you just talked about him. I'm not going to read this entire thing, but unfortunately, very unfortunately, uh, Chris Dickerson had made a post just two hours ago. Uh, and I'm going to put a link to it in the chat for anyone that does want to go and read it. You can find it on either his Facebook or uh, on his Instagram. Uh, but it starts out by saying, after having two radiologists and an orthopedic surgeon review my MRI Im- images, there are a lot of findings. I have moderate to, ze- to severe osteoarthritis in my hip. Mm-hmm. It's bad enough that it's caused multiple bone spurs. I also have avascular necrosis. This means there's a part of my hip that is not getting blood flow. As a result of that, my bone is dying. The necrosis is just starting, and it's very tiny and localized right now. My hip is apparently deformed enough that they asked if I was born with a birth defect or had been in a major car accident. I've never had any issues with my hip until the T-pad slip at DGPT Championship on October. After rehabbing it all off-season, I felt 90% better. And he goes on to talk about this, and, and later he 
uses the phrase hip replacement uh, until I'm 50, uh, making appointments, trying to reach out. Uh, you scroll down more, it says, this shouldn't have any extreme impacts on my disc golf career. The biggest thing right now are keeping blood flow to the area, continuing PT to strengthen my muscles around the hip, and a finding a, spe a specialist for alternate therapies. My pain is minimal to none for now, and I'm hoping to keep it that way as long as possible. So anyway. You have to wonder if uh, wow, just the repetitive concrete constantly throwing if that has anything to do with i mean maybe he was predisposed already maybe he had something from birth that he just didn't realize maybe he there, there's a lot of things that we don't know and you know we obviously wish nothing but the best for chris uh in, in all all of his recoveries and that hopefully he can continue to have a a, a very long career of course but you know that's got to be scary yeah, I mean, it's it's the longest post, you know, coming from Chris that I've ever seen on any of his socials and providing this update. And, and of course, nothing but, you know, big hugs and, and love and support and, and positive thoughts for, for Chris and, and his, his wife, Brittany, and, and all of his, you know, extended family and fan base, uh, as we're fans as well. It's, yeah. it's uh, obviously, yeah, big deal. Um, and, and I guess it's something to keep in the back of your mind to be fair. I, I don't know how much this factors into, you know, some of the performance we've seen from him this year. It could be, I mean, it sounds like he doesn't have any pain, but that's not to say that it's not mentally anguishing and, and hard to think about that. Every time you you're planting, you're thinking, well, am, am I doing more damage? Am I? Yeah. And, um, it sounds like some of these, obviously, some of these discoveries are new. And, and also within here, where I kind of skipped over, he had talked about, he talked with Seth Muncy from the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, and, and had conversations with him, and he'll continue to have conversations. But this is, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just wild to read. And you think of Chris, who's 28, 27, 28 ish, maybe 30. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be insulting. And, but he, he's, he's, he's not nearly as old as you and I, Johnny. He, what are you talking about? We're spring chickens, Terry. <laughs> yeah. So best of luck, uh, and hope, uh, everything is as good as it can possibly go for Chris, mm -hmm. but that was posted, uh, to his Instagram and then, you know, subsequently to his, uh, Facebook or in whatever order. So, uh, we wish him the best. It's, it's really interesting. Cause I think We've talked about this before, the length of the courses, the the constant playing week after week after week, whether we're going to see more injuries. It might also be that, are we going to see more injuries? Because just more people are playing. And, yeah. You know, it, it is, is it not the, the actual courses and everything? But, you know, when you had 30, you know, when we were younger and you had 30 regular touring players, if one of them got hurt, you're like, ah, whatever, one out of 30. Well, now that we've got 250 touring players, when it's five of them or six or seven of them that, that are that are injured, it maybe feels like more, but statistically, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just, I, I don't know. It's just something to think about. Yeah, well, um, I, I, oh, that's what I was going to quickly Google was just... Uh, Whether you can donate a hip? Yeah, uh, no. Because <laughs> you got some hips, tear. Your hips don't lie. Funny enough, Shakira told me that. Really? Yeah, she huh. said my hips don't lie. Uh, that's she told me that, and I was like, <laughs> Shakira, Shakira. Uh, that's how I think that's how I replied to her. <laughs> anyway, I was going to look. Chris Dickerson, in what we've seen from him this year, uh, is uh, a 28th at the Chess.com Invitational. Then a sixth at Waco, a ninth at the Open at Austin, and a seventh this weekend at Jonesboro. So um, that's what we've been seeing out of him this year. All right. Um, another part of the story from this weekend that is, uh, I, I think, worth certainly not, I think, is mm -hmm. worth repeating. And to some, if you're really hardcore, you're, you may even roll your eyes and say, duh. Our FPO international contingency continues to provide to show up to show out to be so many of our stars obviously Kristen leading that way but Evelina proving 
she's figuring things out. Mm-hmm. Not everything, not permanently necessarily yet, but she is damn close. Enough for the the opening win, of course. But just to read down the leaderboard, you have Kristen, Evelina, Hedeline, Luke. Uh, all, those four are in your top ten, finished in your top. Silva and Silva and Silva. So five out of your top ten this weekend that finished. Te- uh, technically as, twelve. As they fin- no, technically top ten. Well, it's top ten, but of She's of in the top ten. I know, but I'm saying you there's twelve players. You wouldn't. You'd still say top. You 10. would, but you said five of your top ten. So I would, but it's twelve. Five players. of your top ten spots. <laughs> there's technically <laughs> there's twelve. There's twelve at one spots. Point we had six. Six of them in the top ten earlier in the round, and it just it's awesome. Um, I you know there's there's really no sub point or point c or b or d or f here it's just awesome to continue to see that uh that parody and to see mm-hmm. so many international uh so much international representation and the fact that clearly it's not just finland you know early on it felt like maybe it was just finland uh with the way it felt like they kind of had a sh- more representation on the mpo side mm-hmm. but on the fpo side we've got obviously finland we have norway estonia it's uh yeah it's just absolutely awesome to see so uh, a, a couple other shout outs. And, and I know you mentioned Rebecca Cox, certainly off to, you know, having a great start here to the season. Uh, stronger, the strongest start of the season, I guess we'll say that we've seen from her yet. And then I made the joke that whatever Stacy Kiefer and uh, Kevin Kiefer had for dinner Thursday night seemed to have done the trick. They both came out with with stellar first rounds. And then ultimately they both fell back this weekend a little bit, but overall, as a couple, not, not too shabby of a yeah, weekend. Yeah, Stacey Kiefer taking ninth place. Yeah. Uh, I think that's her, is that her best finish of the season uh, out, uh, on outs- the DGPT? Yeah, outside of the, you know, she won Tallahassee. But coincidentally, she won Tallahassee as a silver event a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's... 17th, that's, 20th, 21st, and now 9th. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, good for them. Uh, awesome to see. And, and again, kudos to Kevin who, you know, just a few months ago had surgery on his uh, on his ACL and is completely battling back from that. Yeah, you uh, saw him in the knee brace the exactly. entire weekend, and that's got to be... Uh, we've seen, as Paige Pierce is recovering from an ankle injury, she was saying that now she's just starting to finally feel really secure in that. I can't imagine... It can't be much different than a a, a knee injury. Just the, the, the security of planting on that foot or ankle or knee. And I know for Paige, I think it's her off foot. It's, I don't believe it's her plant foot. It's her push foot. Um, but still, either way, it's, it's, it's great to see that injuries can't keep us down. No. So, uh, yeah, those are a couple of the, I, I don't know, quick, quick comments and thoughts that I had when I saw some of our players uh, out there this weekend. Um, a few fresh faces, and then you would be remiss to, if we're in that category or in that conversation, Emily Beach having her best uh tournament here so far in the uh, early goings of the season so that was awesome to see as well and uh hopefully we'll be seeing more uh if you rewind some of you may or may not be all that familiar with emily beach we were there for the breakout (laughs) event and gbo that emily beach had a few years ago at gbo that's when we saw her for the first time on live coverage that was she was like 16 i was gonna say that was 20 2015 2016 yeah i think she was like 16 or 17 years old she was young. I didn't. I didn't realize she was that young. I but think. Okay. Possibly. I, I, I think she was. Okay. Either way, uh, maybe we, seventeen. We'll see. We. But. That's when we kind of initially saw her, though, and um, yeah. So just thinking, dynamic disc slash GBO whatever uh, is now right around the corner as well, and and thinking some people may not have necessarily known or recognized Emily um, this weekend, but good to see her out there, and uh, she fell back a little during the what, the final round, but. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Jonesboro. Just uh, some of the hurdles okay. that, that we saw this weekend. Scoring was not necessarily as detailed as some people wanted it to be. Mm. Um, the statistics, the, the things that a lot of us are looking for in telling a story, they lacked scorers this weekend it feels like volunteers whatever the the issue is jonesboro just 
there were multiple cards that didn't have that didn't have any detail on them and it it has to be addressed like it, it's that's one of those things if you want to be and we're going to get into this maybe this conversation next if you want to be a, a a a real deal sport you need statistics like detailed statistics it makes everybody's job easier from the booth to the fans, to the players, so they can see, like, oh, gosh, it would be really nice to know what my circle one percentage is right now, but I don't know. So I, I think that this is a problem that the Disc Golf Pro Tour needs to solve. And it's difficult because I'm sure they rely a lot on the local um, tournament director to to try to rally up volunteers. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I mean, does the event truly care if the statistics aren't there? Like it doesn't, it doesn't affect them one way or the other in the long run. They do. But of course, I mean, of course they do. Everybody wants the best thing. Everyone wants their event to be the best. I get that. But ultimately this just, (laughs) I, I think about it in my management position. If one of my, if one of the people that I rely on fails, it rolls up to me. And that's how the Pro Tour has to look at it. If the event fails to get volunteers, it rolls up to the Pro Tour and it makes the Pro Tour look bad. Yeah, and ultimately, of course, Brad and the crew, they obviously, they care. How it gets rectified, how it gets addressed is obviously the question really that's at hand for you. And I, I don't know what that is because there are spectators, there are people that are out there or, you know, they have an active disc golf community mm-hmm. and then fans that come to spectate and be part of the event. But as you're saying, we need the scores for everybody. And I understand that sometimes the toughest scorekeeping might be the first card on Sunday morning mm-hmm. of, of FPO because they're, they might be 30 strokes back and they are not the household names and it's a, 730 you know start whatever i can understand how to some that might not seem as appealing as a volunteer base and uh, but we it, long and short is yeah you're right we need to figure it out and the same could be said on the bottom npo card again might not be your household names um you, you're not going to be able to necessarily see some of the other action or it's going to you know work your day in a certain way that it doesn't work out and c- covering the second to last npo mm-hmm. card doesn't you know, get you all fired up, but you're right. Somehow volunteers have to be maybe forced into, (laughs) I, I, I mean, I think of a few incentives that we can do. We, the pro tour. (laughs) Yeah. You don't incentivize anything. I don't incentivize anything. Nobody wants you. If, if you, I mean, you're not wrong, but that's fine. If you do one of those last cards, you're off the course. By the time the lead cards are going, maybe you get one of the lead cards then. Because if you really want to have front row seats, that's mm-hmm. what you got to do. If you want to see Simon and Mason Ford and Anthony Burrell and whomever, that's great. Guess what? Maybe you're the guy that or girl that scored the the ten o'clock round bottom MPO round or the seven thirty FPO round. Other things they can do. I was thinking for incentivizing some custom discs that the Pro Tour brings along, like some some exclusive. Custom discs, some nice, uh, they, they have to be premium High scored, second to last MPO card. Or, Third round <laughs> sure. No, just in general, some, just some generic, really nice, premium, a, a really cool DGPT stamp, maybe a t-shirt as well, and say, hey, this is, this is our volunteer package. This is what mm-hmm. you get for, for, for scoring. And, and it has to be known because... It, 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 like you said, it's going to be tough in some, some places to get these, but I think if you can incentivize these things, it will help out. And I'm yeah. sure the pro tour has thought all about this, but it's just something that, that we need because of our next subject that we're going to talk about. And that's how the disc golf pro tour signs a comprehensive partnership with us integrity. And you're probably asking who is us integrity? Uh, U.S. Integrity. Nothing I'd know anything about. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, U.S. Integrity is a company that actually works with major sports organizations and companies to, 
I don't want to say guarantee, but to get gambling into sports books. And in order to do that, you need to make sure that all your I's are dotted, all your T's are crossed, that the that everybody knows the do's and the don'ts on sports gambling. You can't, I mean, the obvious ones are you can't have players gambling on this on their sport. Mm-hmm. You know, so if this does make it into a sports book, you can't have uh Anthony Barella betting on himself. I'm gonna win this one. Ah, you know, it just you you cannot do it. So there has to be some ground rules. And that's what U.S. Integrity does. They they work with a pretty large number of organizations. You can go out to their Twitter where they've got, I think only, which I was thinking at first, like, I they only have like 1,400 subscribers or followers. But I'm thinking, who follows this company? Why would you unless you're probably a degenerate gambler? Um, so it, it, it makes sense. But they have and work with a lot of um major betting institutions, as well as professional organizations. So ultimately, this is the Pro Tour and the PDGA starting to lay the groundwork for sports gambling. Which has been met with, what? Well, well, let me ask a question instead of guess. How do you feel like it is divi- the, the camps are divided in terms of Yay, this is awesome, or boo, this is terrible. What, what do you, where do you feel like the I, straw poll response has been so far from what you've seen on the socials? I would say 70-30 in favor of it. That's what I've seen. Most of the people are like, yep, this is a natural progression. We knew this was going to come. Um, it, it's fine. I do or I don't gamble. It'd be. I see some people like, it'd be great to gamble on someone, and someone's like, eh, I'm not a gambler. But there is a, a, a loud 30% contingent that are like, this is bad for the sport. We're too small. There's too much chance of people shaving strokes and this and that. I, it, it's valid concerns. But, you know, you, you see people as always like, oh, everyone's just trying to make a buck, buck off our sport. Now we're going to get these live broadcasts um, that, by the way, nobody really wanted to watch five years ago that they were ripping on and it was they were awful. Um now our live broadcasts are going to be nothing but DraftKings commercials like every other sport. And maybe that's the case in a couple of years. I, I don't know. I can't see the future. But I think for the most part, a majority of the people have come to the realization that, yes, this is a natural progression. Do I think it's going to bring more eyes to the sport? Probably not. Do I think it increases interest from some people? Yes. If you have a wagering interest... Look at March Madness. How how much less interest would there be in March Madness if there were no brackets? Do you really care about that 5-12 game? No. But I, you know what? You're sitting down. If you pick the upset for 500 you, bucks, you sure you do. You sure do. That's right. So, I mean, if, if you're picking Mason Ford to upset at uh, Music City, which he's won in the past, mm-hmm. then m- maybe you are more interested. Maybe you are going to kind of pay more attention. And that makes maybe a bigger fan. In general, do I think it's going to like blow the sport up? And and no, I don't. Um, somebody's going to try to make money off of it, obviously. You know, and that if that's the DGPT or PDGA, I, I I don't know. But going back to the stats thing, you can do this gambling with the stats we have right now with just winners, losers, and strokes. Like that's easy. It's the prop betting. Yeah, that and that's what. I like probably most of you are very nervous about is all of the other things. And then even, and and it goes all the way down to uh, like you were just saying about the, the need for the statistics. It goes to C2 hits mm-hmm. and then it not being correctly marked as a C2. And then that's easy when it's on camera and it can go get fixed. And we've talked about, and you disc if you know we see something somebody could later go back and get it changed to some degree i think players can go change some of their stats right now but i the most specific example i have is kristen made three putts from circle two in round two you look it up right now two days later and i i would bet ten dollars on it that it still shows she made two it was clearly three because she jumped all three and you could see her outside the whisker <laughs> on all three. The volunteer, whomever, uh, mismarked it as a 32-footer. As a 
but she clearly had three right there. Like that's the, the easiest example just off the top of my head where you're in for a massive amount of effery is what I guess I like. It could be right there. That throws out like, yeah. And that's, that's just the easiest example of a lead card of our top player in the world of something that's glaring obvious, let alone did, did Lisa Fakus on the third card really make six from C2 when there was no cameras there? Yeah. Did she make six at 31 feet or did she make six mm -hmm. at 33 feet? If if we're going to get into it's it's the, there's the, a lot of mess. Yeah. If we're going to get into like the prop betting like oh huh, I think you know I'm going to put 100 bucks that you know Kristen Tatar hits at least three circle two putts this round. We will need it will almost be an obligation that you have professional scorekeepers. People that go with the tour, people that are trained every week. You will not you cannot have volunteers for that. It just it, there. It, it's it gets too shady. It gets too you know. If guess what? If I'm if I, if <laughs> I'm Kristen's scoring manager be a scorekeeper. If I'm scoring the fifth card, what's to stop me from before the round being like, oh yeah, Lisa Fakus? Nah, she's not gonna hit any circle two putts this round. That's what I'm saying. And and guess what? She you know if she's on the edge, maybe I score it inside that. You know. Sometimes it's I mean it's gonna be hard to cheat if she throws in a seventy footer. Of but, course. But it, it's those fringe scenarios that you really need to work on. So you need to have a, a dedicated scorer for each card. Now I'm not saying you need, you know, 50 scorers. Cause you could probably honestly get away with like 30, 25 or something. And then they, as we know, they circle back around, but still otherwise every one of your stats gets put into thing. Now, again, you can still make bets on similar to like horse racing. Win place show. You could bet on on over unders of strokes. Like, oh, I think Kelvin's going to shoot better than thirteen this round, or something sure, like that. There's yeah. some of the there's the clear cut obvious things. Correct. I mean, of course. I, I think but, that's still in it. But it it does open up a Pandora's box. Personally, I'm I'm okay with it. With as far as gambling coming into the sport in general, uh, it, it's it's a natural progression. I think we all. For years, we thought it was going to be exciting when we finally see disc golf up on the big board in Vegas. Like, oh, look at that. It's going to be awesome. Look at what we see there. People get excited when there's overseas companies that put lines on disc golfers. It, it, does it take away a little bit of, of our um, grassroots kind of thing? Yeah, but honestly, when it comes to the tour, that's gone. They, that yeah. when it comes to the tour itself, now you can still have, you know, Brad Brad Pete's and all of his his grassroots effort to grow that area. That's all there. But when the but the, when the tour itself rolls into town, there ain't nothing grassroots about the pro tour anymore. It's it is an organization. It is a company, a very well run company that seems to be doing more and more and pushing the sport further and further. So it's uh, the cat's out of the bag, as they say, Tear. Yeah, and and w clearly. You and I only know so much in general, and specifically with this, it, maybe it all does. It's going to probably start with all of those really basic mm -hmm. style bets, and then from there we'll have to see what can even get touched. But uh, is, I have a wait and see approach. Is it going to pan off? Is it going to be worth it? I mean, is it going to be funny when someone like you or I could potentially wager and make more money on the event? than AB does for winning it. Like, what, what a funny, because you think about so many of these other sports, you think about somebody, you know, some bets within the Super Bowl, <laughs> and you know that all these players are, are, are getting bonuses for mm -hmm. being there, all this other stuff. They have their salaries and their contracts, and just thinking like, yeah, somebody could win a, a Q Series event for, for three grand, but I won nine grand because I picked well, so-and-so uh, to, uh, to Imagine this, down. like, like I mean, we... Every year you see something like this when it comes around to like the Super Bowl or even the World Series. There's always a story about the guy who bet his team at the beginning of the season. Sure, sure. I put a $50 bet down that, you know, the Brewers are going to make it to the World Series and win. And it, it was yep. a thousand to one odds. And now I'm going to be, you know, X amount money. Imagine doing that. Imagine sitting at the very beginning of the season and saying, I think Anthony Burrell is going to get five tour wins this year. Mm hmm. 
And what are the, it, cause again, you look at the beginning of the season, what are the odds of that? Like a thousand to one. I, I don't know odds very well cause I'm sure. dumb and I don't gamble that much, mm-hmm. but let's just say it's, it's a, it, you know, a thousand to one and I put down 10 bucks. Why not? You know, and now that's looking pretty good. <laughs> three, three out of five, he's got a lot more to go. Anything could happen. So I, yeah. And the fact that, as they're saying on the board, the fact that, we are largely self-governed, you know, with the exception of a few marshals that kind of roam a few sections of the course. We're, we're for the most part, self-policed and self-governed. Uh, what can that bring into play? And, and, and uh, I'll, you got to go to an elephant in the room and say, what happens when Gannon, I hate to pick on him, but Gannon clearly takes 42 seconds on hole 17 and now there's tens of thousands of dollars of, of wagers on the line can i wager that he's going to go over the but, 30 but seconds that he's not called on it <laughs> you know like sure. obviously all of our rules have been our rules and we always argue you know week in and week out as to you know what they are and how they're called or applied da, 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 da. but now you're talking you're betting a, you have a bet against gannon and now you're watching him clearly take 42 seconds or cupcake, whoever, you know what I mean. Nico, it doesn't matter. You're watching them exceed it. You're screaming at the TV because you're saying, call, call him, call him. It matters more now than ever. Like, I don't know. It's, and and that still just may only still ultimately relate to stroke play. You you have a bet Mm -hmm. that Gannon's going to beat, I'm sorry, that AB is going to beat Gannon. They're tied up there on the 17th hole and Gannon takes 57 seconds you're you are losing it more than you already do. Uh, who knows? Maybe. Who knows? Uh, all, a- anything. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see how it plays out. I don't know enough about professional sports betting to know how dangerous this is, but I, I I'm cautiously optimistic. I maybe would be a fair statement sure. about this. A uh, Carney on the board says a percentage of all the bets should be split with the players, and I say. Ooh. No. Wow. Is that that's not normal? Is no. It? No. That'd be, no. A, that'd be crazy. No. The the way it would in theory work. No way. Is somehow the pro tour, whether it's through statistics or licensing or what, will m- make some money off this. Because if I'll tell you what, if there ain't money to be made, the pro tour probably ain't. Yeah, we're we're not messing. With we're it. not messing with it. That money then goes back into the pro tour slash the events, whether that's the tour. We'll just play pretend the tour championship, the you know uh, the all through the season. Let's say have the season, everyone gets an extra five thousand bucks in their purse or whatever the number is. That's how it gets back to the players. It's it cannot be a direct cut to the players, and it's it's going to get filtered through the pro tour or the PDGA. I, Again, it, it all depends on, on how things uh, pan out with this company and in the long run. And remember, this is just step one. This is just a company getting us set up for the integrity so that we can go to Correct. these booking companies and say, hey, look, we're a legitimate sport. Here's why we're a legitimate sport. We can do, you know, we've got all of our all of our bases covered. Let's get us on the books. Sure, yeah. And I, I, I guess without reading the article, there's a chance that this, it doesn't come to fruition, clearly. Sure. Possible. Right? I mean, you'd have to assume if they're the authority on it, they ultimately can say yes or no or, or helping you get to a yes or no. I think they're consultants and their goal is going to be to get us as close as they can and the, the, the pro tour, whoever is going to pay them. And then at some point, they'll get to the point and be like, all right, this is as good as it's going to get. Now we go to the books and we see. And I, I've told this story before and maybe I'll reach out to him again because it's been a, quite a few years. There's a gentleman who makes, who does lines at one of the casinos, who is part of a community that I'm a part of, uh, that listens to a specific podcast. I asked him years ago, I said, Hey, what would it take to get disc golf in the books? And he told me, I'll, I could probably look it up at some point in my email, but more or less, he's like, you need a long history. You need really good statistics so that we can do a lot of research and a consistent tour of a lot of these things we already ha- we have now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, because we all know that. Uh, Vegas isn't putting up the odds unless they think they can make a profit. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, a lot of people look at prize picks that, you know, ate a bunch of dirt a few years ago when they put up some bad lines because they didn't know, you know, when, again, when, when you're putting up lines on Tuesday or Wednesday and the event starts Friday and everyone's looking and going, Oh my God, like 
it's going to be crazy windy at Jonesboro. That's going to push the scores down. They they didn't have that type of information mm -hmm. to, to be able to adjust that because they're putting up lines so far ahead of time, probably basing them more off kind of ratings and the course and a little bit of history. And, and ultimately, the disc golfers took prize picks for quite a bit of money, is my understanding, and yeah. they and they pulled it. They said, okay, we're not making money on this. We're not <laughs> doing it. It's not going to be like that. It, it, again, it's going to be more so probably um, you're, you're betting lines with winning and losing. Like, who do you think is going to win this weekend? You know, Anthony Barella is a three to one this weekend or whatever it is. And Gannon Burr is a, you know, a four to one. Or I, again, I'm making up numbers because I don't know. I don't know gambling. But, yeah. but those are the type of things that will probably happen. It won't be like the prize picks crap that we saw in the past. So that that's to me, I'm looking at it as two separate things. Now, uh, obviously, you've got your DraftKings, and they all have sports books and getting us into like fantasy, where you're you're paying a bunch of money to set to set players, and you're playing against other people, like a fan duel, and all. There's there's a lot of future possibilities, but it's uh it's definitely going to be something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on over the next couple of years. All right, well. It's a step forward. Where it leads, only time will tell. So uh, congrats, though, because I know just the idea of having these conversations and getting this set up to the point where it is now is obviously a significant undertaking. And maybe at some point, someone like a, a Sean Jack, who is probably helping lead some of this uh, partnership, it'd be worth having him on here again. It, I mean, it'd be worth having him anytime. But, it's always good to have uh, Sean on like once it, a year. It would be good to uh, check in with him on that. So and maybe we'll do just that once once the next step is learned or taken. All right, let's uh, let's talk quickly uh, to, to officially put it to bed. We could talk about Jonesboro and uh, <laughs> you want to talk about some Vegas odds about acing. Oh, geez, the same hole back to back days. Waden sides. Birdie's hole 15 in round one. Good for you, Waden. One of these year holes out there. Nice work. Round two, Waden aces it. And that's how we kick off the broadcast for round two. We go right out to the course. We've got a static camera on hole 15, one of the dedicated cams for the weekend. Uh, one of the you know added benefits and improvements that Disc Golf Pro Tour pushed hard for uh, to develop and to make sure that it could happen for this year, and it's it's paid off in a number of ways throughout different events. But hole 15 dedicated cam is one of those spots. The next day, Wade Insides aces the same hole, same disc, same throw. It's eerie how close even in timing everything is. Like the they. From the time it leaves his hand to the time it hits the basket, it makes sense. You have same disc, probably you kind of have this. You have to almost have the same speed because you did it twice. Um, an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Yeah, well, watch it again. It's just, it's, it's just insane. <laughs> his mouth was more wide open in in the second one clearly he should be in complete disbelief no it wasn't the same shirt that was the first question is he, no no he had nope. a yellow paneled shirt versus a black paneled shirt not that i would care if you're wearing uh, a different or the same long sleeve shirt out there on a on a slightly windier day I, I've this never... has to be one of the coolest things in mm -hmm. our sport yeah i mean there's there's back-to-back -back aces, which are awesome. And I don't know if we've seen that on the Pro Tour. Everyone has stories about it happening at local leagues or at a local event. I don't think we've seen it at the Pro Tour, a back-to-back -back ace. Um, same card, same hole but no. between two competitors. Um, we definitely haven't seen back-to-back -back aces by one competitor in hole after hole. Not, not on film in the tour. Not on film in the tour. Rock Searle. Yes. 2000 Worlds. <laughs> yep. Got back to back aces in the PDGA Pro Am Worlds of 2000 over in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Aced, I, I'm, I'm going to say five. Aced hole five. The very next throw was him acing hole six. Insane. Awesome. 
in every regard. Unfortunately, yeah. that was 24 years ago. There wasn't <laughs> video of either. If it was, we wouldn't be able to even see it right now. It'd be so pixelated. Uh, so certainly the props to him. And there are, there are countless stories of people getting aces, getting multiple aces yep. in a round, doing all this cool stuff. All of it very, very awesome. It's up like 100 additional notches when you have it on film. Yeah, and it the same hole with the same disc back-to-back days. Like, he dialed. What did he do on the other round? Uh, he birdied it. I, I said that. Yeah, he oh, did bird, he? Okay. He, uh, So he played <laughs> hole 15 in four strokes this weekend. <laughs> Just think how many people bogeyed or doubled it oh, in one God. round. Whedon played hole 15 in four effing strokes total. I guess that's the question is, does it, would it have made it any cooler just for the story's sake? Had he four or five took an eight on it in round one and then done this? No, it's cooler that he went birdie ace ace. Yeah. Okay. I think so. The only thing I think that would have made this cooler is if he would have aced it forehand one day and backhand the next. Uh, like, walk up and be like, nah, I got it forehand. I'm going to do it backhand. And then or lefty. It. Or lefty. Could have been cool. Sure, but sure. there is something really awesome about watching that video and just the the mirror of it, how yeah. identical it looks. No shock. Just pretty awesome. Was there anyone on his card? I want to know if there's anyone on his card that, that was, was the, the same. same. I don't. That, like, that's like, a good question. I mean, that's sure got, that, that would be get... kind of cool. Like, hey, I was on the card with Wade. Well, and no, if you go back, I, I, I think we could almost see almost everybody. Yeah, I know Austin Hannum was on it second round. He wasn't on it first round. Uh, I, I don't know if there were any, uh, any of the people. My, the joke that I made uh, is when you look at how he finished out, he went five. Oh, it was a rough end. He went uh, uh, one, three. He went seven, five one yeah. three seven four or something like that in round one. I'm like, that's not far off from my zip code, honestly. <laughs> when you look at it, uh, uh, I'll dox myself. I'm five zero seven three two. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, and then he had a very similar second day on how he closed yeah. out. He, he, uh, he, he birdied he, the next hole both rounds. That says something. Yep. He had a rough seventeen and eighteen both days. Yes, exactly. So. Uh, so impressive waiting and, and then just like to pile on to the cool story. He's 16 only, uh, it's like his third pro tour event and, uh, only found golf like during COVID. Well, like, when you're, th- that was like three years ago. I know. And but, he's 16. So he found it when he was 13. Uh, the, and the fact that here he is yeah. getting double aces, uh, in this event. Yeah. It's just all of it. Very cool. He's got a younger brother who I think is only like 14, who was also playing in the event. Mm. Uh, L- Landon Sides is out there and was playing as well. And his younger brother is, I think, two years younger than him. And then just to put it out there, just so you can say that I told you someday, uh, no relations, can, coincidentally, to Braden Sides, who was out in the field and playing as well. So you've got so the wait. youngest at Landon. Then you've got Waden, who who aced. And then Braden sides from a different part of the country, different sides of the country. <laughs> How did we had an Jonesboro this year had an all Paul card? Yep. They had an all lefty card. Yep. How did we not have like uh, an all sides? No. From three, all sides? <laughs> three sides of the story card. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So um, how did we not get that? Come on. <sighs> you're failing me. You're failing me, Jonesboro, <laughs> with your theme meme cards. Yeah. So. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, I believe it was uh, Matt Homie Lavasco who, in one of the years that I had gone to play in uh, at uh, Lemon Lake, played in a winter event. It was a winter doubles event, if I recall. It was winter singles or doubles. I don't know. I think it was doubles. He aced the very first hole which I want to say was hole five at the time, four or five. He aced the first hole at the end of the round, aced the last hole. Mm. So on the scorecard. Back to uh, back. Yeah, it looks, it looks like, like it was back to back. It happened to be his first and last holes. Um, but anyway, again, everybody has all these epic ace stories uh, that, that have unfolded and, and many of them very cool in a lot of ways. But back to back aces, <laughs> it's just... To play one hole in four strokes <laughs> is insane. Uh, 
just insane out there. Uh, yeah. Considering all the people that Ford in, 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 uh, in one round, man, he was more it under. It really took you nine shots to, to play that one this weekend. <laughs> he was more under on that hole than it took him strokes to play. Uh, yeah. He was five under <laughs> on that hole, and he only took him four strokes to play. <laughs> yeah, and uh, both rounds, obviously that's two under on one hole. I think both rounds, what did he shoot, like even or one over? Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, not enough to keep him under par. Nonetheless, congratulations. Great job. Uh, if there's ever a time to get on Sports Center, I, I don't know if it ever happened. I didn't see anything saying that it did. But if there's ever a Sports Center worthy, it's you know yeah. ace uh, scenario that would have been it. That's for sure. Unfortunately, there's this other golf tournament going on during the weekend that probably took a lot of the it top was, shots. I, I barely watched it. I watched a little bit on on day one and two, but uh, Scotty Scheffler just kind of he had a lead. He never really gave it up. It just it. I, I can't say it wasn't exciting because I didn't watch it. I don't know, but <laughs> it. I, I kept track of scores, and I, every time I looked, it was like, oh, look, he's still got a three-stroke lead. Oh, look, he's still got a three-stroke lead. Oh, look, he's still well, got a three-stroke I mean, there's still other people that you know hit great shots. No, I don't care about them. <laughs> I care about the winner. All right, let's uh, – let's talk. Jonesboro is officially done. Yep. Congrats to Brad Peets. Congrats to Kristen Tatar for uh, taking down another victory, her second of the year. Um, lots of great stories. What else did we see out there? We saw one other A tier this particular weekend. It was the Daniel Bow Memorial Weekend Two, which is their open weekend. Uh, Chris Hinegar wins this one at twenty three under par, besting Max Nichols, one of our favorite lefties, by three strokes, as well as Sias Elmore, uh, who hasn't been on tour really much this uh, no. last for a while. Um, that was your top three, and Cam Rico, yes, related to. One Steve and Bamba Rico. I believe that's Bamba's son, right? Correct. And uh, was in fourth place as well as Garrett Tapkin, who it's a name I don't know. So congratulations, Garrett. That was your top five in MPO. Uh, going down to FPO, you've got uh, Sheila May Lai, who shot two under par, five strokes better than Violet Main. And third place was Sophia Donaghy. So congratulations to your uh, to your FPO and all, all names you've seen uh, over at uh, not only necessarily the Memorial but also mm-hmm. uh, at the Phoenix Ladies Open. So yeah, uh, great to see all of them out there. And I got to give them a shout out. We mentioned him just a few seconds ago. MP40 winning this one. Stephen Rico. Dang, yeah. Stephen. Which everyone knows him as the uncle. To Cam Rico. <laughs> yeah, or or uh, maybe most known as Little Spoon. Oh, yeah. I mean, some people call My him that. My Little Spoon. Some people call him that. Yeah, so congratulations, Stevie, on on, a, on another win. One stroke over Chris Shotwell. Should have been Chris Shot Better. Mm, hey oh. Hey oh. It's my favorite joke every time he doesn't win. Mm. I'll I'll do it till the day I die. Yes, I'm sure he appreciates <laughs> and, and, that. And when he sh- and when he wins, I'll I'll say something like, like hey, it, it matches his living name. up to his name. Living up Chris to his name. Shotwell. Shotwell. So clever. So oh, clever. He's never heard it before. Get, I'm get sure. Get you in the booth. Speaking of the booth. Oh, the booth. Looking for feedback on I don't know how solicited this really needs to be, but looking for feedback on the uh, companion cast. There was a f- this weekend. We had another one. Yeah, and this time over at CCDG. And I and I don't need any. Uh, I, I'm I'm speaking high level generically. Uh, we specifically have also been propositioned to uh, host a potential companion cast. Joe Mez uh, obviously had it on their channel. It was I think it was Big Germ, and then uh, Brian uh, chimed in over at the U.S. Women's. Kind of a funny one at the u.s anyway uh but then this weekend ian and central coast hosted theirs on friday on their channel and then sunday it was exclusively behind the dgn pro model subscription and i i'm just curious how they're received and this isn't this isn't a hey how much do you like or dislike a germ or a brian or a, or an ian or nothing of that nature just the the concept is are people utilizing it? Well, Do people care about it? Do people know about from it? From what I saw, I looked at on just this was the first day when it was on YouTube. I looked at the main broadcast and the companion broadcast. And the okay. companion broadcast at the time um, had, I believe it was 140 viewers. 
So it, not a lot of viewers on the companion cast on that original day. Now that could have been, you know, it, maybe that was a low point. Maybe it got much more. I honestly tuned in one time. Sure. I flipped over just to take a look. And I think it was, maybe they were just starting the MPO round, like a okay. hole or so in. And I was like, oh, that's right. Ian's doing the companion cast. So I popped on. I think I saw 140. I don't know if if it went way up, if it went down. I, I don't know. But that's, okay. that's what well, I did see. Uh, coincidentally, it's in my YouTube algorithm uh, right now. Uh, Jonesboro Round 1 DGN Companion Stream uh, shows that currently, uh, you know, a few days later after the fact, it's got just shy of 3,000 views. I can't see what the peak concurrent was. You, no. So you're probably spot on with something in that neighborhood. Uh, I, I'm just curious. And, and the, oh, by the way, there are two. Currently, there are two, I think, after the fact comments. That say, uh, love this coverage and Birds of Paradise, Salmon Creek, California. That probably was an answer to some question out there. But love this coverage. Again, I'm just wondering, is, is it something that DGN as a company and then the companion streams should continue to uh, yes. monetarily or, or otherwise invest in? Yes. I'm going to say yes, regardless almost of what the... Stats result say, is what the stats say. I think it's a really good add-on. I think it helps promote the the pro subscription because the final day you need to be a pro subscriber in order to get that. Yeah, which yep. As well as the um the companion holes that they show, like the whole fifteen that we saw. Right, that was fifteen, fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, whole fifteen. Those are behind locked behind the pro subscription as well. They add value to the the overall quality of the subscription and i don't know if you can truly monetize that accurately to say oh look let's let's use this the number 150 on day three ian had 150 concurrent subscribers on dgn again i'm making that number up because dgn doesn't show concurrent subscribers mm -hmm. or concurrent viewers let's just say it's 150 can you can the pro tour look at that and go all right 150 and maybe that's 150 people that would not have signed up for pro that are signing up to watch the companion stream you could maybe think about that in a monetary uh, monetary way but i just think it adds value to it and i know the pro tour is going to try other things i think they're going to do like a uh, a silent stream where it's just mm. nats um because that's pretty easy to do they just literally stream it again and take out you dumb commentators um uh, yeah, there's. We know Ian had mentioned he's going to do two more. I think this year. I think the Jomez boys are going to do one more this year. Okay. Uh, I thought the Foundation guys were supposed to do mm. one or two this year. I don't know if they are. That was a lot of early season talk, so I, I can't say for sure what has changed. I do know Ian had mentioned on this broadcast that I think he's doing two more. Okay. So that that much I think is pretty pretty set in stone. But could there be too many? Uh, and here's yeah, what I mean by yeah. that: is because Stokely did one this weekend. That, that was Facebook. like an unaffiliated one, right? Sh it, sure. Yeah. I, I'm just, and here, no. Here's what I mean: is it, it, my understanding is there's kind of a, there's an open entity invite that if like we wanted to do one, mm -hmm. for instance, we could. My question is: let's just say there was an event, and this isn't I don't think going to happen. But let's just say there's an event that Ian is doing a companion stream. And it happens to be a tournament that you and I love that neither of us are currently working. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do a, a companion stream. It, it, my point is, is there a, a point of offering these where there even there's a saturation within that? Like, mm -hmm. would it be silly to have two different companion streams going as well? Uh, yeah, I think you could almost have too many. Okay. I, I think you're... Uh, Right now, you probably, I think having more than one, I'll, I'll call it this, more than one alternate commentary stream. Like, I think you could get away with your, your primary stream, a, we'll call it a Nats stream where you have no commentators. And Na then Nats being short Na for natural, not, not G N A T, -S. not G N A T <laughs> so you guys or Natty ice or anything like that. Well, uh, that, maybe you'd have a few of those with it. We could. Um, and then having a, an alternate commentary stream. So kind of those three options. Other than that, I don't think you would ever want to do two alternate commentary streams. You wouldn't want to have an Ian as well as an official Stokely one or an official mm -hmm. Smashbox one, or it just, I, I think at that point, Sure, you, you you could maybe you know we get 
a, a dozen people to watch us that are hardcore Smashbox fans. Um, but I, I don't see the advantage in the pro tour of really drawing that out now. And that's at this point, you fast forward five, 10 years. If your concurrent subscribers and concurrent viewers are in the 50, 70,000, hundred thousand range, maybe, maybe that makes more sense because you, you're, you're, you could maybe accommodate more different type of people. But at this point, I think we're too small to really kind of spread ourselves out like that. That's my personal take. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. Well, anyway, they were out there. They're available uh, for no better reason than just to make sure that all of our viewers and subscribers and listeners know that that's something the DGN is doing. And even by the remarks here on the board tonight, it doesn't sound like overwhelmingly people are are, are blown away by the concept. And again, this is no... This is no value judgment on on the people doing them, but just even just the concept. Uh, it's it's intriguing to me. I don't know that. Um, I don't know. I, again, I'm I'm different. You're everyone's a little different as to when I'm not mm-hmm. working a weekend. To then feel like I'm still kind of working that weekend um, when I usually then would try to fill it with a hundred other things uh, within disc golf that I would do. I don't know that that's that's the way I'd want to spend two out of my three days. No, necessarily. But maybe if it's an event that I love that I'm not Mm. involved with, like I'm not going to lie. If, if I were to be interested in one, what if I'm doing one, like, like a, like a beaver state fling or a course I intimately know. Um, then again, I I guess I don't even know what the style is because it's any, that's, that's the thing, the common stream, it's any way you want. That's what I mean is anything you want. It's your personality. Everybody, uh, I'd be curious to know what everybody wants or expects out of that. That's what I think is, is maybe even just uh, reading through that is probably tough. I, I, I hate that. I hate that idea. I hate thinking of what anybody expects or wants that, that type of commentary stream should be you. Mm. Your personality, you shouldn't be trying to accommodate any particular, like, like, oh, do they want this really funny or do they want more of a serious take? Well, yeah, but do you want play-by-play or do you want me just interjecting? Like, I think that's a fair question. Uh, I, I, I because think as a play-by-play host, day in and day out, I think it's I'm, what you want to do. When I'm in, in the seat, I get, that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm obligated and paid to yeah. do. And maybe you want more of that. Or maybe you just like me to give you... Uh, I want, honestly, I want it from you personally interjections i get to hear your play-by-play every freaking week Mm -hmm. and that's great you're i I think you're very good at it you do whatever it's it's fine i want more off the cuff terry i want more and i have ideas as far as how i would handle it it's funny because i think i'm not i think i'm fairly certain the pro tour kind of runs these streams like Ian dials in and the, he, he, he's, yeah, he's fed the same stuff. Correct. We're fed in the booth is my understanding. He, exactly. Right. Um, the same feed. I, I have different ideas on how I would like, if I were to, if I were to host one, how I would like to do it. Mm. And, and that's it. it and I would want to run it right here with my own buttons. Mm. Personal, sure. Personally, like you, well, maybe you tell them that's what you I, want. L- I bet you they would love that. They'd I know be, they would look at me and go, "Wait, we don't need to dedicate a person to to doing that," um, because I again, I, I've thought about it. We've done companion streams mm-hmm. before, uh, just whatever. I, I I honestly debated doing one this Sunday, and I'm like, because I wasn't really doing much around the house. My son and I went for like a, a bike ride or something. And I was doing just offense. I'm like, I could spin one up. But then I was like, oh, wait, Stokely's doing one on Facebook. Ian's already doing one. I, I, fe- I would feel rude almost doing one in that, like, I'm trying to take away from their scenario. So it, it, it was a very fleeting thought this past weekend because I know Jonesboro as well as the next person that's watched it for, for sure. eight years, eight or nine years. Uh, so. But again, it's I've got a few things I want to work out and, and take care of and, and and do before I would ask or you know to run a companion stream or do a companion stream. It's just you're because I'm, I'm like you. Odds are I've got something going on. You know that's if if my wife sees we have a free weekend or I have a free weekend, she's probably scheduling something for me. Uh, all right. 
so that was something that came to mind, and uh, I get I, clearly we'll see we'll see how many more there are, and then we'll see uh, how how hard we go on them as to uh, how well they continue to be received or or get tested out throughout the year. So they're out there, they're available. DGN Pro subscription. Yeah, go get, get go get yourself the Pro subscription, among whatever else uh, all the other all the other amazing things that that gives you. <laughs> Uh, the only other news is some PDGA news. Uh, there's a new Scholastic programs launched, and you can check it out on the PDGA.com. It's the Scholastic Club Grant Program. It says here, in a grassroots effort to help grow the lifetime sport of disc golf, the PDGA Youth and Education Committee has developed a new grant focusing on school clubs. The objective of the grant program is to support and incentivize members who currently supervise or wish to supervise a school-affiliated affiliated disc golf club now this to me does not sound like your college club this to me sounds like more along a youth in education so you're probably talking maybe probably high school middle school high school yeah junior high middle school yeah. and end up there might maybe, be maybe even elementary school if you if, if, if you got a big enough organization that that has you know a bunch of little kids that want to play so ultimately this is kind of addressing some of the situations that we've heard about people saying, hey, I, I think if we want to really grow the sport, we need to get the PDGA in at the elementary level. <laughs> uh, yeah, and what, uh, in addition to that very obvious uh, agenda and statement of getting uh, the youth involved, this also, uh, and I don't know how many they're going to ultimately give out, but what this also does is it can help answer a question when somebody says, "Hey, where is my PDGA money going? What is it being used for?" The P, you know, you, how many mm. thousands of times have you heard people say the PDGA should really do insert whatever their agenda yeah. item is? This this yeah. could be on the list, and now this is a way in which they're doing that. Now, again, it says uh, five hundred dollar five hundred dollar grant five hundred dollar grant. I, I'm guessing there's uh, applications. Um, they'll be accepted year round and it'll be reviewed by the youth and education yeah. committee. I, I don't know exactly how many that is, but, uh, the fact that it out there and it, it exists and is, I love it. Uh, to be fair, it's not too far. Uh, maybe I love it because it's not too far fetched or different from something that we currently do in Wisconsin as a, specifically as the Wisconsin disc sports association, where, any event on our tour, which is right around 20 or so stops, money is collected from all those tour stops. Uh, uh, we'll call it a tax, uh, a $1 or $2 tax on every player. That money is pooled together. It can be anywhere from 10 to 20 to 25 grand or whatever it is at the end of the year. And then people are, uh, are, are heavily encouraged and, and beat over the head to submit for various grants and Obviously, education, youth in school, uh, disc golf and, or disc programs in schools, course development, lots of different things fit the category. So this kind of falls along those lines, but is more channeled in the sense of going after clubs at schools or school clubs, which is awesome. Like there's a there's a there's a narrow focus here, and uh, you'd be an idiot if you're not applying for it if you fit if you check those boxes. So it's. Nothing to lose is is the way that I would look at that. So nice work by uh, Justin Manichelli and the rest of the uh, members that got that off and running and make that happen. Um, yeah, I would say that's about it in terms of actual news for now. I don't know that there's anything, you know, there, there's a lot of sidebars and stories and this and that that ha have unfolded otherwise, but I, I feel like that, that covers pretty much everything we need to worry about for tonight, doesn't it? I think it does. Well, with that, I guess uh, I guess we could call it. We could call it for the regular show, and then when we come back, we can uh, talk about a few other random things that are maybe going on in life, in disc golf, or beyond. Congratulations to our champion, who was our main guest here to open the show tonight, Anthony Barella. Thank you so much, AB, for joining us. Congratulations on the 
not just this win, but the insane start that you've had to this season. Hot. The fact that we've seen you take down three of these events already. Kristen picking up her second event win in uh, in six events. Our only two-time champion here uh, on the FPO side within this 2024 campaign. I would have predicted that, that she would have been a two-time champion by now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think a lot of people would have. And, uh, and, and now she is, and... She has a title she's going to try and defend here in Music City this weekend, and then uh, a title she wants to defend at Champions Cup, and then I know she's headed back to Estonia for a little bit of a break, and um, that's that's going to obviously be a good thing for her as well, I'm sure. So thank you guys for joining us. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back for the after show, we'll talk about some disc golf topics, non-disc golf topics. We'll also have our weekly giveaway uh, if you're a Patreon supporter and or you've gone out to Patreon and uh, to our website and, and submitted your uh, no purchase necessary um, entry into our giveaway, we thank you for... Uh, I've got a giveaway story actually coming up in the after Ooh. show uh, with regard to that. But for AB, along with Johnny V, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. That's Smashbox TV podcast number 502. And uh, we'll see you in the after show when you step inside the Smashbox. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash smashbox TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV Podcast 502's After Show. A sneezy, sniffly show tonight, apparently, for all of us. Anthony Barella started it off. It's all his fault. Yep. Hit me then, hit you as well. Yeah. Just kind of getting us all tonight, which is funny. I feel great. I don't know why I yeah, suddenly I, sneezed I, here. I feel much better than I did a week ago, which you is much better than two better. weeks ago. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but here we are. So welcome in, everyone. It's the After Show after show consists of uh, disc golf conversations generally. If you got questions that are disc golf related or otherwise, the YouTube chat board is the easiest place to submit something. Maybe you're watching along on Facebook, all three of you. So you can still uh, put in your questions there. We'll try and answer them or uh, discuss any topic that you put up. But uh, also they can get off the rails and not be disc golf related, which is kind of where I'll start. Okay. I had to go to UPS today to deliver some boxes. Uh, it's a journey there almost every day to deliver boxes, my disc in a box, a hundred count shipping or, you know, going out to somebody. What a, what a subtle little plug there. I Not so pull into the UPS parking area, which is kind of, a, I'll call it a strip mall like atmosphere, but I pull in there. There are zero cars to my right and zero cars to my left. I pull into a standard parking space 
and I'm sitting there wrapping something, turning something off or doing something on my phone for two seconds. Actually, I think I was posting, I think I was posting the AB picture uh, to, to put them on Instagram for tonight. I think I decided to do that quickly thinking, oh, I meant to do this an hour ago. So I'm posting that. A woman in a small SUV that also had, I don't know, maybe a 15 year old in the car pulls up next to me and is so effing close that if either of us opened our doors, it's impossible to get out. So did you only have one spot on each side of you open or did you have multiple spots? All of them were open. And she chose to park right next to you. And she, to the point, and, and, I, and I looked, to the point where right next to me is fine. But I'm like, no, you're like, right next to me yeah. to the point where when I did eventually look, she was out of her yellow lines and into my yellow parking lines because she was that close. I'm perfect, it, and it, perfectly parked. And it was a small SUV, not like a, a, it, it, like a, like a hybrid SUV. Yeah. Like eh, this woman's a bad parker. I, I looked at her. I stare cause, cause I, I'm, I'm pulled in <laughs> forward and she pulls in the other way. So we're like opposite. So Obviously, the front of my car is going one way. The front of her car is so going the there, opposite. So you were looking right ne- so next to her. So I'm looking right at her. Like right next to her. I, <laughs> and I just stare at, I stared at her. Uh, I, had the, I had the restraint to not just scream, what the f- are you doing? Wow. But I stared at her and she, she, oblivious. Well, that goes, I mean, par for the course then. I, it now makes me think of the, the the meme with the urinals where there's yeah. one guy and all the open urinals and then somebody goes and stands saying, yeah. what? I, I still right now with every fiber in me have no effing clue what in the world she's thinking. And, it had, and I cannot stress this enough. If she parked perfectly in because, her spot, because my guess is you're there parked, would be enough room. Yeah, you're, you're parked probably... As close to the the entrance that you no, not even oh, because there, there's think, like, two spots that were closer. Oh, I was gonna say because you know if there was nobody parked there, I would think oh someone would pull in and you'd park in the prime no, spot next to no, the. No, I was I didn't even pull into the prime spot. There were two <laughs> empty spaces to my right and and three or four to my left and and essentially nobody in front of me. Okay, like it was basically an empty parking lot, and she pulls up. Almost on top of me. I'm just like, what the f- are you doing? I, w- I was so baffled. So I stared at her. And then I turned my car back on. And, and frustratingly, not that she knew, I put my car into drive and I pull up the 10 feet into the next wide open space on the other sure. side. So she probably couldn't even have gotten out of her car. No, <laughs> we couldn't. We could. I, I wanted to sit there and wait to see what she was going to do because I had to finish the post anyway. Sure. And I wanted to wait. And I was like, how is she going to do this? And then am I going to scream at her once she hits my door? Because it'd be, an, it would be with her size, uh, which wasn't small, nor am I, but she couldn't have physically gotten out of her car door. Hmm. What? Unless she was just going to send the 15 year old in. Which she didn't. That's a good question. Okay. She didn't. Not that you should still park that close to somebody because no, you. Because yeah. I couldn't get out. Because you couldn't get out. I, know. I couldn't have gotten out of my car. Uh. She couldn't have gotten out of her car. So I turn on my car. Put it in, in drive. I pull it up 10 feet. Again, a whole nother row of empty spaces. She drove through those empty spaces to get to where she did. Wow. I pull up and I park. And then I, I, she gets out and I, I get happen to be getting out a moment later. And she's going into the Domino's, to, uh, which is literally right next door to the, to the UPS. And I'm just staring at her like... And I, 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 I held back. You... I held back, surprisingly, because I, I am... Believe it or not, folks, I'm good at being a dick. I held back though. I didn't say anything. Uh, I don't think she caught any of my looks and that was the end of it. I just, I am still baffled to this moment. What in the world possessed? Again, if she, if she parks good in her spot, I'm like, okay, that seems a bit much, but But there's space, but that's fine. There's a space and that's fine. She was literally in my yellow spaces, like that much into mine. Hmm. You can't think of a, Tell me, you cannot no. possibly think of a logical reason, can you? No. 
No, no, I, I, I mean, you, you were close. If she's sending her kid in and not thinking about her having to get out, it's still weird. Then you would just probably pull right up yeah, to the door. Exactly. There's a hundred other ways that that would still go down. I, mm. All I thought is even if I wasn't in the car and she did get herself out when somehow, when either of us came back to a car, when you're parked that close to me, how are either of us supposed to get back into our cars? What are you thinking? Maybe she thought you were cute. Just wanted to get up close. Check it out. See if you had a ring. I don't think so. No? Okay. But that Because initially I thought to myself, does she not know I'm in here? And then when she pulls up and she sees me in my car, she's definitely going to just pull away. Right? Just to take any other spot. Mm -hmm. You're not going to park to some next to somebody that close when they're in the car and maybe having to get out because she's not knowing how she's even going to get out. She's definitely going to pull away. I waited for that moment. No. Nope. No. Hmm. I... I... <laughs> Anyway, I was to ship out some uh, boxes and uh, a disc that I dropped off, along with a whole set of bags. But uh, I'm all worked up just thinking about it again because it, it was so <laughs> dumb. Uh, it's, I mean, I, it's, it's the world we live in, Terry. Uh, I mean, if, I, I, if I had to guess, just because I think it was maybe a 15-ish year old son in the car, I'd guess she was 30-something. Um, you know, you could maybe factor in, oh, is she a brand new driver? Is she old and senile? Everything. 35-ish. Okay. I don't know. No, it was not a fancy car. Uh, someone's asking if it's a BMW or Mercedes or, a, or a, you know, any car of any significant massive expense or, 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 and or no. maybe entitlement that you think goes along with it or whatever. No. No, those, a, like, those people probably park further away from you. They're yeah. probably more conscious. My wife, it frustrates me sometimes to, to, like, if I'm in the passenger seat and she drives around a parking lot because she will pass perfectly fine spots just because... There is a car next door, not even like poorly parked. And she drives a Jeep Grand Cherokee, so it's a little bit bigger, but she will drive closer. And I don't, in fact, I usually don't park up front just because I have two good legs and I can walk. Um, but I'm not going to pass up like a spot that's four or five back. My wife, she'll just like drive around and look for a spot that's more open so that she does not, as she calls it, get a door ding in her car and I, I get it i respect it i'm the fine. same way and, and my car's not that fancy but it's still no. almost brand new and it's a, it's a I, bugatti i would call uh, that fancy <laughs> i i just i i McLaren. do feel like and i've even taught my daughter if you have the option of like this space or this space i would take this one mm -hmm. for this reason yeah uh just because if you can avoid the chance of somebody else dinging your car then i'm of, i'm good with course. it still for now Fast forward five years, and if my car's got a bunch of dings or like is, is a little more beat up, yeah. maybe like yours, whatever, it's just older, then maybe you get a little looser with it and you're not as concerned. But yeah, right now, knowing there's mine is relatively dent and scratch free still, uh, by the, by the, <laughs> some, some uh, amazing luck. Yeah, I, I, I will sometimes, yeah, go a few extra spaces if it means staying away from some of the more populated spots but yeah i drive it not when this woman's parked on top of me i drive a 2009 honda fit it's got rust spots on the doors like kind of where the, the all right quit the, flexing the already we got it. We got it. I, I, this guy don't care i'm kind of hoping people kind of bump into me and hit me i'm like come on there's an insurance claim come on somewhere. insurance even if they pay me cash i'll just be like what did you do to my car oh my neck my neck uh, perfect uh, uh, uh quick Quick side note again this one's definitely non golf related but uh being out in bend this weekend for the first time some of you have been familiar with it i don't have a big rant about it or anything uh, or spiel but uh i went to good life as a brewery it's a it's a sizable brewery uh, i think nate doss told me they do more beer in a single tank than nate does in a whole year i mean so they're they're sizable enough. Mm -hmm. uh, good life. So if you're familiar Whoa. with Bend and or that area, you probably have heard of them. Uh, I heard of some beverages that I might like over there that turned out to be just okay. Uh, they had a couple of stouts on tap, a Snickers stout, which I thought would be, you know, a top five for me and it wasn't. And then one um, stored in some, what, George Dinkle uh, bourbon barrels. Eh, it was okay. Uh, pretzel was good. Check my Facebook. It's all out there. Bye. Yeah. yeah, got to take in good life, uh, which interestingly, I think more importantly, the bigger story to that really is 
when Nate and Val had moved to Bend and were getting serious. Well, they had moved to Bend for quite some time, but then when they eventually got serious about brewing and starting Bevel, Nate interned and worked at Good Life for a oh, few months. that's cool. And so there's definitely a, a, you know, a connection there. And, yeah. and then one of their main brewers, which just helped them win a gold medal at a, I, at a big beer festival. I saw Nate's post. Also worked at uh, Good Life for a while. So anyway, some of you saw it already, but yeah, pretty cool. I uh, got to check it out. Terry, you'll be happy to know that Smashbox TV's taxes, boom, have not yet been have filed. been filed for an extension. Yes, yes, <laughs> only because we keep yeah we, we keep work running from that law. Oh God, it. we run 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 run. No, we work with LWS. Yes, um, because you know they're they're awesome, and I got them all the paperwork last week mm. and, and said, oh hey yeah, remember me. Um, uh, I'd love you to do our taxes again. And he's like, okay, cool. Get your stuff in as quick as you can. I'll see what I can do. So I think I had it all submitted by like Thursday, which I I am under no pretenses to know that going to some a, a tax person on the final week, I'm as big of a jerk as everybody else. I'm sure everybody's doing that. There's, And so he's like, well, if I get to it, I get to it. If not, I'll file for an extension. Well, so today be, yeah. or yesterday, they notified me. They're like, your taxes... We filed an extension because I also get my personal taxes done there as well. So, seeing as how just get it all done at once, I can submit everything. So, so we won't know Terry for a few more weeks if we're going to be in jail. If we're going to be in jail, okay. So Patreon.com uh, for yeah. bail. Yes, yes. Put right in the notes, <laughs> bail. Uh, uh, I was looking for the line, and I, I think the closest line to it is, "Yeah, poor planning on your part does not necessitate an emergency on Correct. And I yeah. told him, I said, of course I understand. No, I, like, I, I, there's nobody that lives by that more than I do. <laughs> I so. know. It's it's one of those things. It's, you know, if, if, if I show up, you know, if I plan to get my hair cut and I schedule it four days in advance, that's a lot of time, I think, for a haircut. Taxes? Mm. Not so much. Not so much taxes. No. Uh, sorry, I was just reading through that. I saw the looks like some updates to the Las Vegas challenge. Uh, They're moving it out of Las Vegas. Asking no. AB and then now seeing what he'll do with that, I think is is obviously fair for AB. But I think it's going to be interesting who will be making game time decisions yeah. to possibly withdraw from that. And that's no knock on the event. It's just. When you're talking about the tour and you're talking about going from the dynamic disc open over to the OTB two weeks later, it was intentional that one of the longest trips of the year had a week off in between and just the fact they're ready for a week off. Vegas is right in line. It makes mm -hmm. all the sense in the world to play Vegas if you're looking to play a big event. And we have big names and, and lots of people are signed up and presumably playing. I'm curious, though, just as we heard from AB, who may get to that point. If if any one of our top players wins, let's just say one or both of the next two events, when you're looking at a Music City yeah. and the Champions Cup, let's say you win one or both or whatever, Does that is that enough for you to be like, you know, I don't know if I need four rounds at Vegas. No. Uh, I, I, I'm ready for the mm -hmm. week off to reset for OTB. Of course, I hope every single person that signs up goes and plays because they're playing for the fans, they're playing for themselves, they're playing for the event. I'm not suggesting or wishing otherwise, but it's not going to be shocking is, when w w of when two or three of the top 10 decide not to show up for some reason. Yeah, and and real quick, uh not that we're paid for the plug, but you pull up the the list. There's Yeah, I, I did There's I, some very legitimate names I and, did, yeah. and this has this has significantly beefed up i feel like in the last few weeks so so maybe everything i said is irrelevant because these guys just recently did sign up the the field is getting more stout i feel like calvin heimberg gannon burr ricky wysocki matty o isaac robinson a b joey buckets bradley williams aaron gossage alden harris all like, 10 29 or above yeah for those, those 
Matt Bell, Nate Sexton, like, and so I, on. Like I don't foresee Calvin dropping out. It's a big in of an event. I, I think he'll probably maybe feel more more of a pull or obligation to go there. Gannon tends to roll with Isaac and Elden. I don't. I wouldn't foresee him dropping. But as we said, Ricky. Would it shock me if Ricky didn't play? If he if he wins an event coming up, takes the week off. Not at all. Matty O. Same thing. I could see Matty O. Like just kind of deciding. Yeah, it's maybe I'm going to take a week off. Uh, you know. But it's again some of these names. It's not going to be shocking. Some of them, I think. You know, as we said, A B. A B might not play. He might just look at him and go like, I could go for a break. Yeah. There, there's there's no reason. So. And there's a few other, you know, events going on that weekend. Not that these guys are going to go play those, but there are some yeah, other. Yeah, there's the 303 yeah. uh, taking place up there in Colorado. That's a Q Series event. So if you're looking to get points and qualify for the for the Pro Tour, that's where you need to be. That makes perfect sense. And it's already a well-established good event, but mm-hmm. that's going on that weekend. And I think the Masters Cup is going on that weekend out in, in California. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm trying. I was trying to remember all the things I was looking at. Yeah, the Masters Cup, which has a a, a couple of uh, very legitimate names on it as well. So, yeah, and we're, as we see, the FPO a little bit lighter on your top players. Um, Jen Allen is your top player for Vegas, ratings wise. Yeah. Ratings wise, uh, then Cat Allen, Lisa Fakis, uh, Luke, Murray Oliva, Sophia Donicky. So I, I think you're seeing the FPO maybe kind of. Uh, they're taking a break, and I believe most of the overseas players at this point have probably have gone back overseas and are kind of taking that break and prepping for Europe. Well, and nothing for nothing, it's also the Copenhagen Open weekend. Yeah. So it's the first event on the uh, Disc Golf yeah. Pro Tour Europe side, and to click on that, you see Nicholas Antela, Ezra Robinson, uh, Lori Lettinen, Jakub Semerad, Chris Clemens, Jesse Niemannen, Greg Barsby, Paul Uliberry. So you're going to have players over there as well. So talking about a... Uh, world a, spreading. A, yeah, a worldwide spread out weekend uh, on Mother's Day weekend of all weekends. So anyway, I just something that is interesting of note. Uh, and, and then some players that just flat out might not play anywhere. We'll see. All right. Uh, what else is on the board? Is anyone filming LVC? That's a good question that Ryan has just asked. Uh, at one point, I remember I was boarding my flight to Singapore and I got an, a, a message from Jeff Panis saying, hey, looking to help out LVC to, to figure out media stuff. Could you submit a, a, a proposal or a bid? Which I put together and, and got minutes before I went to Singapore mm-hmm. back in January. Um, it, it sounds... When I caught up with him again recently, Jeff Panis, it sounds as if Gatekeeper is uh, doing FPO and MPO for that weekend. So they're doing double duty. Uh, Gatekeeper will be uh, uh, in charge on top of it. I don't know if there's any other cards outside of lead card for both of those that uh, will have any focus by any other teams. But I know Gatekeeper is going to be uh, on it. So, uh Yeah. Uh, speaking of coverage, I'll say Citizen asks, are we getting any coverage of the EU events? The Pro Tours doing Pro Tour stuff with European uh, camera ops labor. and such, yeah. Uh, what that all exactly means, Johnny nor I really know for sure. I think you're going to have all European commentators, sideline reporters. You, I think it's going to be an all European crew almost exclusively. I think more, is it more disc golf media or more disc golf? Um, I think they're going to be a large backbone of it. Yuha and a ton of others. I think it's going to be almost exclusively all European manned, so to speak, and uh, and then featured, you know, within our within the DGN. But that's that's my understanding. Okay. So I guess we'll see. But speaking of coverage, one announcement that got made, I think, on Friday morning. Uh, that I'm excited to share with everybody is I'm heading to Mexico for my first time ever in any capacity. Golf. Like on the run? Are you? I might be by then because that's going to be the week after Worlds. So who knows? I'm going to probably pay, play some big bets on Worlds. Oh, good And call. then in the last putt, when somebody's not doing what I need to do, I'm going to scream. It's going to throw them off. I'm going to win the bet. I'm going to win like probably a million pesos and I'm effing out of there and off to Mexico to never see me again. That's great. 
I don't I haven't thought about this, but <laughs> don't put much thought into it. Just do it, Terry. <laughs> The million, oh shoot, I, you know, I'm such an idiot. I don't even know if a million pesos is a lot of money. I'm guessing it's not now that I think oh, about God, it. Oh God, no, no, it's like, <laughs> no, it's probably, it's probably like $400. No, it's 58,000. Okay. <laughs> 58,808 right now. So yeah, 58 grand. Yeah, I'm going to win 58 grand on the worlds, uh, at least for one of the divisions. <laughs> Who knows what I'm going to bet Multiple on the other one. Multiple ones. And then, uh <laughs> But yeah, the week after Worlds, uh, there's an event uh, and uh, teaming up with Fabian and uh, Disc Golf Mexico. And, That's and, awesome. Uh, Dynamic Disc Mexico. Uh, just super excited. I don't know even know every single detail just yet. Obviously, uh, I'll continue to promote it and talk about it as it gets closer. But it will be my first time ever stepping foot in Mexico. I'll be flying into Mexico City. Uh, we are about two hours south of Mexico City is where the event's going to take place. We're going to get coverage. I'm just... So excited to be uh, introduced to the entire culture and the community. And I know Gatekeeper, excuse me, GK Pro has done some stuff. And Luke Humphreys and and Kevin Jones and those guys, Paul Omen, I believe, and a few others have been down there yeah. um, in some capacity. I'm excited to go have my experience down there as well. So super, super excited about it. And uh, that announcement was just made official and uh, announced, uh, I don't know, Friday or so. So I wanted to share it with you all here. I've been kind of hinting at it for a few weeks. Ooh, I'm not disrespecting the pesos. I just don't know how no, many. No, I how think much I, they're worth. I, I think he said oh. he was. That was directed at me when I jokingly said it's worth like four hundred dollars. Uh, yeah. See, I, I, I have heard that the bot is uh, is struggling to the U.S. dollar right now. So I don't know. Are there? As naive as a question as this is. Oh, you're gonna ask me something <laughs> smart, and I'm not gonna know. No. Uh, can I just go anywhere and cash out and do a currency exchange at any point? Anywhere just to play the currency game exchange, right? Like, I could. I think so. Now, every time I've had to do a currency exchange, almost every time, you, you have to show your passport. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, you're not necessarily going to that country. You're just showing your passport. And I think you can get currency exchanges from your local banks. Yeah. So I don't know what's stopping me from going in and getting a whole bunch of Thai bot right now when it's really weak against the dollar. Somebody, somebody tell me, give me this update because it feels like a game I'm ready to gamble on. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, uh, if I'm being blunt. Terry's looking to make all of them tens of dollars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> What did I say? You don't know what you don't know? Well, uh, he's, uh, Ryan Pilcher says local banks tend to give bad deals. Yeah, there, there is always a discussion as so to whether you should, go to you the should be doing it at, the, at an airport or if you should be doing it at a destination airport as opposed to mm -hmm. you know, the, the international one you're flying out of. Should you do it, you know, a departure or an arrival? There's, there's obviously, it's like the stock market, there's, there's a lot that goes into the, uh, the timing of it more than anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I have some ideas. <laughs> I definitely have some ideas. <laughs> They're not good ideas, but you have ideas, which is I didn't a start. Claim they were good, which is a start. Uh, <laughs> um, says can't wait to hear about all the Mexican beers. Yeah, you get to try some new uh, flavors. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, if I have to oblige, <laughs> that, so that's so. all there is to it. Uh, uh, the dollar is accepted at most touristy places. Yeah, uh, I guess it probably depends on where you go. Uh, no Terry approved beer in Mexico, just meaning uh, stouts or pro. I can't imagine that heavy, dark, 15% stouts are a, a very popular. Uh, they're already... In Mexico? Yeah, they're already probably not. regional and, and, and seasonal more than anything. Something tells me that that's not a popular genre uh, down there. But mm. again... But sometimes I'll, I'll go on that uh, that hunt for you. Well, Jim Brown says you're better off drinking the beer than the water. Mm. And that's true in some spots. You definitely need to be careful as far as what you consume and what you drink when you're down there because different uh, different things hit different people differently, Terry. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, side note, uh, unrelated in every way. <laughs> I'm... I'm intrigued and a bit nervous about going to see 
my 13 year old daughter's first ever tennis match on Thursday. Uh, hmm. She'd never swing a swung, swang, swung. You think uh, she can beat Anthony Barella? <laughs> <laughs> no, she never uh, had, had used a racket in any capacity prior to two weeks ago. I'm interested to see how this is going to turn out for her and her friends. Yeah, you would think that. And I didn't get her professional lessons. C- clearly. Um, they've got to have like some sort of JV squad that they're, she's going to play against another JV player. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's like a million fresh. kids in like going to be an, grade. It's going to be ugly. Oh, so is she playing like inner squad? Uh, it's against another school. Oh, but I'm assuming it's hopefully other brand new seventh oh, graders sure. that, that are, are equally as yeah. uh, versed. Uh, I mean... You you would think that they would that they would definitely rank them and like oh hey look Kenzie here has only been playing for two weeks let's not put her against you know the other seventh grader that's been playing since they were three and yeah it, it I I think she'll be fine it'll be an ugly match that's that's why but, I say it. <laughs> but it will be fun to watch yeah. and I I am uh, yeah. I am definitely I'm looking forward to it and and we'll see how it uh, all shakes out when it's all yeah. said and done. Yeah. A wonderful disaster, says Ray. Ah, that that is some that is some great phrasing. I, I think that's going to be the case. Uh, I am also excited that at some point here in the next uh, week or so, heading down to the Peoria area to check out the Northwood Black redesign. I think is a strong word. You guys have seen lots of different parts of the Northwood courses over these last few years, and I think there's. A, almost a hybrid of sorts that's going to be part of the Champions Cup where we're pulling from some holes that you saw just last year and then maybe other holes from other parts of the the property and the course that you saw a few years ago. And then that's what's going to ultimately design this final course. So what you saw for second or third round last year at the uh, Ledgestone is not exactly what you're going to see for Champions Mm. Cup. And with that, I'm excited to go... I don't think there's any major changes. I think it's more of a rerouting and then some polishing up of things. So I'm I'm, I'm excited to go take a look at that in the next uh, few days down there in the Peoria area. So, But as far as I know, to answer your question, Ryan, same layout for all four rounds. I believe that's going to be the case. Same course, same layout, all four rounds. MPO and FPO will play different tees. I don't know if there's going to be any different pins or not, but they're going to play from different tees. I believe that to be the case. So. And you've got some business down in Peoria as well as yep. checking out gonna, the course. It's going to help you cover for when you do the coverage of the event uh, out of Bend. Yeah, I um, I think that uh, refreshing myself with that property will be great. And then also checking in with you know Nate Heinold and his crew just to get some of the additional insights or tidbits that I can, knowing that I'm going to be in the booth in Bend along with Doss and Sexton and then Val. Um, oh, yeah, so, oh little, Sexton isn't going to play? No. that's uh, it's uh, a, No. It's a major, which is why it, was, it surprises me a little bit. Yeah, I do not believe he is registered to play. I think we're, I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. Which, uh, that's fine. Okay. I just, I'm yeah, just Sexton, a little surprised. Sexton, um, you know, he's playing LVC. And I think we had to talk about it that there's, uh, you know, there's just select events he's kind of picking and choosing throughout this year that he's going to be participating in. And if he's not participating and there's the booth in Bend, he's going to be joining us at said booth in Bend because uh, it's just a couple hour drive for him. So nice. We'll, we'll hear from him quite a bit this year. So that's kind of cool. Um, what else you got? You got anything? Uh, not too much. Just uh, been wandering around the neighborhood. Got the got my bike out and down. It's been right. finally the weather's a little bit nicer. So I I grabbed two of our bikes and I yelled at my kid. I said, "Hey, get up here!" And I made him go for a bike ride. Which he's not. It sounds funny because you and I, when we were younger, lived on our bikes. Mm-hmm. That's you know. So to see him get out and he's 14 on a bike maybe for the 10th time in his life Mm. like just how still a little unsteady he is and getting started he's pretty good he's pretty solid on a bike these days but uh he does not bike nearly as much as i feel like he should Mm. (laughs) for a kid his age but different you know different life than what we had so everything is yeah yeah so but getting him out there was good we went for you know two two and a half miles around the neighborhood 
uh, went down over by the lake and whatnot. So that was that was good. Uh, watching watching Fallout with my wife, which is based on a video game. Okay. It is post apocalyptic. Okay. Kind of a comedy. Mm. Um, it's got a bunch of a bunch of people you would recognize. At one point, like Michael Rappaport shows up. Um, Kyle McLaughlin is in it. You'd know him if you if you don't know him by name. Mm-hmm. But uh, just there are there are quite a few people you look at and you're like, oh, I know that person. They're a comedian, or I know that. And I think we're three episodes in. We've kind of been taking it relatively slow. It, they dropped them all at once, which doesn't seem to happen much anymore. And so far, I'm, I'm I love it. It's good. I like to play the game. I've played I think two different versions of Fallout in the last ten years, and it's it's just it's good so far. It's it's a slow burn, but it's pretty solid. It's it's funny. Mm. So, so yeah, thumbs up from John if you want to watch something. <laughs> Tim says I binged it all in one day. That's a little too much. I I made and I'm gonna throw it in quotes the mistake of inviting my wife to watch the first one. Because I didn't think she'd find it. I didn't know what it was going to be. So I, 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 f- I wasn't 100% sure if she would like it. It would have been better off if she didn't. Because I could have probably burned through them quicker. <laughs> but now I need to wait for her so we can watch. It's you know the, it's kind of the, the downside of inviting your significant other, your partner, your wife to watch something with you. Is that now you need to take it at their pace. Hmm. So, oh, he was on vacation last week. That's why he got to burn through it in one day. Mm. Well, lucky you. Yeah. No. Other than that, I'm doing interviews now at work and we're hiring someone from our department. So Ooh, I, should I apply? No. I'm qualified. I don't think you are, but Damn it. actually you probably are. I for what yes. I'm for what I'm looking for, you would be qualified. What, what, give, give me the job description. It's and basically help. Task. It's basically help desk. Oh yeah, yeah. all day. They're just like answering. I yes, can't. idiot. Let me reset your password. <laughs> yeah. Again, did did you hit reset? Yeah. Turn off the computer. Yep. Turn it back on. Yeah. I can't print. Yep. Um, yep. I locked myself out. Uh, I can't log into this or that. Yes, it's. A, I think I got a dirty virus. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, it's a lot of that. Um, setting up. We're we're doing a big upgrade over the next. 16 months because windows 10 is no longer going to be in under support mm, okay. um, next year october so we want to make sure that our company is up to speed with windows 11 so okay. it's going to be basically 16 months of somebody just, isn't setting windows up 11, 11 pretty old already uh windows 11 is supposed for a minute to, yeah but it's going to be supported for like the next eight years okay. so and they don't have anything else so it's not like you can go anywhere else Try a temporary password of dipshit two. Yes. <laughs> no, try dipshit three. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. So, so I'm in the process of hiring and I get to deal with, uh, uh, you know, people who are, I can't say not qualified, um, but narrowing through resumes, kind of looking at a resume and be like, this person doesn't fit because they have a bunch of coding experience. Mm. Why are you applying to a, a help desk position? Yeah. On one hand, I think maybe they're just looking for a job. Yeah, get their foot in the door. Or, or maybe they're uh, they they want to get out of coding and get into more tech support. I kind of have to, you know, I, I weigh those options when I when I have to look at someone, even just to bring them in for an interview. Then, as always, you get the typical: someone says they're going to show up, they never do, or they cancel at last minute. You have an interview with someone who's decent, and then you get their salary requirements, and you're like, "Oh hell no!" Mm. <laughs> like, there's no way you're making six figures at this job, buddy. Mm. Um, it's it's a lot of that. So it's right now, it's finding the right person for the right position. All right, I'll submit. Go, go come on, bring it on, Tear. <laughs> Can I work remotely? No, part time. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, Damn it. part of the stipulation and I've been, our stouts involved, which yeah, is her, uh, it could be. I mean, I've been okay. telling people, even though it is a job that other than the computer setup could be done remotely. I, I require three months of onsite. Mm. Like you've okay. for three months, you need to work onsite before right, I trust right. you. As long as, we're, as long as I start in to be able to October, I could work October, November, December. I could be there. <laughs> I still don't think you could. And then I, then, then I go to Thailand for, you know, four to six weeks, <laughs> but that, that would work. That would work. Uh, I'm a night owl. I could still help. Yeah. Yeah. We could, we could make this work. And Jim says, you're looking for remote work full time. Um, n- again, no remote, at least not for three months. Um, we had a bad experience with uh, one of the employees we had a couple, about a year ago where they just started without even asking, just kind of started slowly working from home. Mm. And I was like, you might want to come in more often and they didn't, and then saw them <laughs> saw them post in the middle of the day that they were at the mall, 
And I'm like, why are you posting this on your socials? Like yeah, where anyone can see not, it. Not bright. Like you're not a bright person. Mm. And so that was uh, that that did not last much longer after mm. that. And so yeah. And it's gonna be a lot of setting up computers. See, I won't even post that I'm at the course or that that's I'm good. that I'm watching Harry Mac videos that, or, that's or drinking stouts. I won't post any of that. Nobody. Well, will you know. can watch uh, you can watch Harry Mac videos at work. Oh, okay. I, I see enough people do it today. I sat down at the yeah, reception. I mean, I'm just listening. I don't even need to watch. Yeah. I'm just listening. Yeah. I, I saw, I sat down at the receptionist station today to, to upgrade a little piece of software because we're getting a new, like, attendant console. And there she had Star Wars. She was literally watching Star Wars on her phone. It just had it sitting right under her monitor. And granted, she's a receptionist. She does specific things. She has a chance to answer phones. And, and she's just like, oh, yeah, sorry. I just kind of have that on the background while I work. And I'm like, I don't care. But hmm. you, at this day and age, you walk around an office, and I bet you out of 20 people, 25 people in our office, eight of them have a phone sitting there playing something. Hmm. It's, yeah. So uh, it's, it, it's, a different, it's a different beast than uh, it was 10 years ago. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess it's not really worth getting too far into, but one of the other, uh, if we're backing up and only because I saw it on Facebook earlier today, uh, I, I don't know what the the input entirely looks like and how it goes down. One of the areas of opportunity for improvement is also some of the uh, marking for the distances and I know we, I went off on a big thing about Kristen being inside or outside of the circle, even just some of the other distances that are closer to the pin. And I think, I don't know if that's a training opportunity to say, Hey, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, these, uh, uh, are they red? The red, usually red, uh, red whiskers are 33 feet and the blue ones are at 66 feet. And then the much closer ones, yellow or whatever color feet. those, yeah. Or whatever are the bullseye. Like, I think that's been a, an area of frustration and it's not new because it's the PDGAs. Uh, it's just that now that exact distances are able, are able to be put in, it be, makes it a little more glaring or obvious. It feels like when one is significantly mm. off, there's a time you're watching somebody putt that is, they, they, they take seven steps to the pin, but it's showing up that it's from four feet or yeah. whatever the case might be that clearly that falls back on, on empowering the volunteers and or making sure that they're fully up to speed and educated. And that part of that plays into what you were saying earlier about the, uh, the overall betting mechanism. But just in general, just in general, we'd love, you know, it becomes a little disingenuous if you look at some of the year-end stats, which we put a lot of stock into now, and some of those year-end accolades, you know, for C1X and for whatever, mm -hmm. all these various stats you obviously want them as accurate as possible. And I think I knew there was no way Marweed was that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, that guy is like that's like a 79%. Oh God, player. I, you're giving he him 79. He just brings wow. his own scorekeepers with him all the time. So I see him out there before he putts, he draws his own circle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's really weird. They're clearly eight feet closer. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. so that all goes into it. And part of the, of a, of a learning slash, you know, growing pain slash learning curve maybe an area of opportunity for, for just education of, you know, we talked about it. Is, is it tough to get volunteers, let alone Qualified make sure that ones. they're fully up to speed with all of these and things. And then they want but, six figures. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh it, it's an opportunity uh, for sure. Uh, I, I would say overall. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, Tim, I, I'm not clever enough to even think of uh, Tim asked what would be my three words for Harry Mack. Um, I, I don't know. It's funny. I've, I, I haven't put a lot of thought into it, but it, he obviously challenges people as a freestyle rapper. He challenges people to give him three of the most creative words. And then he always says, no food, no names or no animals. And then he says, just give us, give me the three of the most creative words you can think of complicated slash creative, give those to him. And then he incorporates those all into his freestyle, whatever it might be. And now he's expanding to five words and seven words and all sorts of other things. And he's not writing it down, which is really impressive too, yeah, that he freestyles for six or eight minutes or four or six or eight minutes. And he's remembered literally all of these words. Uh, obviously some words that are thrown at him are much easier than others, but, um, it, it isn't, it's just incredible what he does. 
I've become a, they, they still say Stan. I, I love watching all these trendy words go in and out of, in and out of uh, fad or, or popularity. So AB quickly. dropped the word today. He's like, flowers is the new one. Yeah, flowers. You have to be giving flowers. And I, I'm not going to lie. I appreciate that. He said those really nice yeah. things about me. But in general, yeah, flowers is absolutely. I, I hadn't heard that before. Oh, but yeah, I knew that's going to come and go. I, I, I knew exactly what quickly. it meant. But yeah, yeah. Funny enough, I was watching a Harry Mack video not too long ago. That's where I heard it for the first time. And it's absolutely like here right now. Mm -hmm. um, dying off from the kids, though, is truss, or tr which is like just basically mm -hmm. short for trust, but like trust me or for sure. Uh, that's almost completely dead. My kids and all their friends were saying it incessantly. Oh, drip. Still, uh, kids, people still have drip? No, no. Riz. <laughs> I, I, I don't Riz even know if you hear is... Riz even as much anymore. No. That, that was so like three months ago. Uh, but, tr but trust, like. Uh, dead ass, I, I feel like is dying a little. Uh, that one's definitely falling. So it's funny because as obviously a father of, of, of two now, trendy a 13, kids, yeah, a thirteen and, and fifteen year old girl, girls, I hear them all to the point where I want to slap their faces. Of like, I'm so sick of hearing these current words, mm -hmm. and then the the humor in them being completely it's, out of their vocabulary two months later. Yeah, it's this type of thing goes so much faster than when we were kids. Like the trends. I mean, we had words that we like rad, cool, tubular, tube. No, I know radical, rad, radical. Rad was the one like rad was definitely one of them. Rad, rad was one of them. Uh, <laughs> you think those words would last a year, year and a half. But the, today all it takes is one influencer to use one set of word and then boom, it's gone. And yeah. it, I, these trends now go so fast. And, and, and again, I don't know if I'm, if I should be happy or sad that my son is so far out of these loops. Like mm. I think he hears some of the words at school, mm. but I've never once heard him try to use a trendy word oh, in his, wow. his whole yeah, life. Okay. Cause he doesn't have a TikTok. He doesn't yep, care yep. about that. If he's watching videos, it's probably something dumb on YouTube, like a Minecraft video or or maybe a Fortnite video, even though he doesn't play really Fortnite anymore. But and he just isn't in that sure. area yeah. of of like hip cool words. Well, it's all so. these kids. Uh, Carney says my kids say mid. Mid has d all but died. Yeah, mid. Uh, it, it it's I, there, well, but I, it's. I heard it on a sports broadcast the other day. Someone they were it was like a talking head show, and someone was like, "Well, what do you think about this?" And someone, what, like an adult, was like, "It was really mid." Well, that that tells you and that exactly. that adult is out of the oh, loop because it's one hundred percent they're and using it. The minute I hear that on a sports broadcast, I know nobody else is saying that Not anymore. Yeah, because one hundred percent. I've always said by the time practically we learn what it is, it's, it's already no out cool. of style. Well, yeah, sus is is pretty much dead. Thank God, uh, I, mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Low key, I think low key has been around so much oh, longer old, than yeah. it will continue to be around because I don't know that it was as overplayed. Sure, and it and it's, more it's kind of been around longer. But kids for a little while, everything was low key this, low key that, low key it like yeah, uh, it'll continue. I think it'll be it'll stick around, but it it won't. It certainly isn't going to die off as quickly as mid or sus are. I think has. Carney has it backwards. He says basic is the new mid. Mid was the replacement for basic. Like I was hearing basic a year, two years ago. Like that's so, You're that's so basic. That's so basic. Like I I, I think I, mm. I, yeah, similar but different. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, there's based, which I. Ah. Yeah. Anyway, so mm. is, is bodacious I, still I in? <laughs> yes, Tim. Tim, I, I bodacious is. Yes. I, I will admit one of the things that I no longer do that uh, Dixon Jowers put out there many years ago in the early days of live broadcasting. Dixon, within his Facebook group, I feel like is where he would solicit people to give him words that he'd have to work into the broadcast. And a few times I played along with it, or some people people would give them to me. That's when we had <laughs> far more creative latitude. Yeah, and you I, could still do it, and I still could, especially if I was good at it. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it, that those were those were some fun times. And then you, because we were always on YouTube for free, every single broadcast, there would always then be the almost the immediate reaction to like, oh yeah, yeah, Here's, you got it in. I've got it, Terry. Here's what we need. We need the Ellie Ezra check-in for hip words. 
She's like the youngest, one of the youngest women on tour. She's okay. probably the most connected but, up. But not on socials. You don't think she's... Oh, no, I know she's not. Like, okay. Like, the, I think there was a real push to just get her an Instagram account in the last few months. She wasn't on any socials. I, I didn't know if she... That's just not how... If she was roll. just more hidden and, and no, took in... No, she was, just wasn't on. Well, then that's not going to work. No. Because I, that... I was trying to think of someone who's really young that's on tour. Um. AB's already an old man. Yeah. He's yeah, out of he's college. Old, or 24. Yeah. He's, he's, he might as well be retired. <laughs> exactly. Because uh, <laughs> he seems like one uh, of the like, cooler kids on Cadence tour. Cadence Burge. But. There you go. Cadence. Yeah, sure. We could maybe get Cadence, the, she, the Cadence Burge check in. Yeah. She's gonna What's the Cadence? To, exactly. She's going to have to give us all the. Uh, Cadence, the if, you wanna, if you want to figure out what the cool <laughs> words kids are saying and let us know. And maybe with, a, maybe with a definition, please, too. Or give us the word and we have to guess the definition. <laughs> there you go. That, that would be a good one for the pro tour to do uh, at some of the pressers is when they get all the players. We're just together. giving them ideas. Yeah, that's Way true. to go. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, LOL, he did an entire round of Ledgestone working in hundreds of arrested development quotes with me. I, I, yeah, I believe it. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. It, 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 and obviously, it's not too far fetched from the, the, the now the guy, the, the kind of semi famous weatherman that is he a news broadcaster? No, he's a weatherman, specifically meteorologist. He works in rap quotes, quotes like mm. rap songs, you know, everything from waterfalls or, or, uh, or regulators, mm. like you name it. He works usually like 90s rap, <laughs> rap songs into his, uh, into his, yeah, is uh, today was a good segment. day. Yeah, it's yeah he's he's kind of famous out there on the uh, on the TikToks or the Instagrams. Cynthia Ricciotti, yeah, she would she would definitely uh, fit the bill really well. She is right in that pocket. I can, uh, and even out of pocket, I feel like now that one's a that one's dying too. Out of pocket was a pretty big uh, line for a while. Was it? Oh I, yeah, you, you, it was totally out of pocket. Oh yeah. Oh. oh. I mean, I've heard the phrase, but not as like a cool oh, kid yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, I mean, it wasn't off the chain or oh, off the God, hook. Jeez. <laughs> oh, God. You're going back 10 years now. Uh, but out of pocket. And, and if I say 10 years, it was probably 15. More like 20. Yeah, 15 or 20. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. All right. I think that's about all that we have. Uh, we, here, here's maybe a question. Well, not, not maybe. Here is a question. I did the most low, low key, <laughs> no low budget, low key version of a bag line review slash introduction. Nate and Val received all of the new grip lineup, including the, the three different bags that are in the grip line, uh, golf bags, regular golf bags, and then what they're calling the disc golf duffel, the ultimate duffel and the travel duffel do i take those clips which were done on my phone in nate and val's garage which isn't the worst framing do i take that and put that into a video do you guys care about that does anybody here care about that i don't know that there's been it's not the most in-depth in-depth i don't break down every single pocket and zipper in every single one of those bags because there's literally six bags and I wasn't about to do a separate video for all of them. Do any of you care? Do I put this together? I feel like uh, I was blessed. It was really more of an opportunity than anything. I was blessed that I had literally every brand new bag from Grip, which just announced their new lineup. Yeah, Grip doesn't pay me or sponsor me or yeah. give me anything. Uh, so there's 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 no kickback in that sense. I'm not keeping any of these bags. They're all, they all stayed in Ben with Nate and Val. I just feel like it's an opportunity that if you care about the new bags, maybe you would watch this. But I don't know. Jim says do it. Well, he's the first one to reply with any response. Oh, and Alfred says, I'd like to see a quick review on them. All right, done. That's going to have to be my next video. I'm going to edit that tomorrow. Do it, Terry. And I think there's a little just opportunity that I don't know that anyone else has put out anything yet. So here's, a, here's your first chance. Okay, so before we end the show. Uh-oh. Phil Bob Goyke, coming out of Wisconsin, says philosophical debate. People would watch it, not him. People. One of the big hot takes yesterday on the socials mm. was... Loki, dead deadass? No. Um, you are familiar with the YouTuber uh, Marquez. 
Was it Marquez Lee? Yeah, MKBHE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exa exactly. Marquez Brownlee. Marquez Brownlee. Yeah, uh, ultimate, very much so. Ultimate player, does tech reviews, whatever. One of the best YouTube channels on the planet, honestly. 100%. 100%. Especially if you're at all interested on trending tech. Yep. Specifically phones, Which, Appleware, uh, Apple stuff, VR stuff, and then he, cameras, and now he's really he's dipping doing cars into and stuff. Uh, cars. Yeah, um, um, he's I, into cars. I, but go I, on. I know him. It's the funny thing is I never really followed him. Yeah, I but love him. He, he he's been around forever. So he did a review of the of a of an AI pin, a, a little pin about the size of a brooch that sticks to you. It it has a little projector, so it can project things on your hand. Ooh. Um, you talk to it. It just like just like you would chat GPT. He panned it bad a lot of people not a lot there were a few people that were upset that he could because he's got so many Much influence influence that he killed it could have possibly just killed this device and he even said he's like this is a bad device as it is you know it could get better blah 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 it um so i'm thinking about you reviewing these bags and that's where i draw a line at like like, like it, if they yeah. were legitimately bad bags mm -hmm. would you say that like, like, honestly, guys, I, I wouldn't recommend these or if they're, I mean, clearly if they're legitimately good bags, which I think they probably are from grip with, they have a really good history. Um, it's, it's easy to be like, oh, these are great bags. Look at the zipper. It fits this perfect and awesome. What about a bad review? We do not see that in disc golf. Hardly ever. Everyone I think is scared shitless to, 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 to lose your contact with something like, you know, if, or to quote unquote, go hard at somebody or something, unless you've got like a, a true score to settle. First of all, I don't want to say that's, yeah, that's not a reason I haven't done reviews. However, no, no, that, I know. that thought is in the back of my mind when I have the few reviews of things I have done, that's always mm -hmm. in the back of my mind is, well, is, is, is this a company? You, you have to think about all the things. Did they send it to you? Did they send it to you for free? Are they paying you to review it? Mm -hmm. Did they explicitly say, you know, make sure you say the good and the bad or, and be brutally honest? Like all of those things come to mind. Are you by default already a reviewer or did you just get your hands on something and you feel a need to rip it? Like uh, to me, all those things come to mind. And then obviously there's just flat out a journalistic integrity, right? That goes with calling a spade a spade and mm -hmm. calling it what it is. Uh, I, I was given a pure bag when I was in Estonia last year. I was given the bag. It's They're made in Estonia. I was given a pure bag directly from the owner. I used the bag for the weekend. And then I did a review where I essentially broke down everything that I saw and experienced with the bag. If there are ways to make things better, I think the best thing you can do, it's like any other drink, is that, so to speak, is like, is that your semi, job? Is but that, to be semi constructive with it, it mm. I, I just think there's a way of saying, like, I, I think it's fair to say, um, you know, th this strap feels a little flimsy to me or feels a little cheap or this strap doesn't feel like it's reinforced. I'd love to see this strap, this particular shoulder strap reinforced. Mm hmm. I, I guess it comes down to a little bit of your personality. Can you say that? Or do you have to just say, yeah, this strap is shit, right? Like, yeah. I think that comes down to just, I don't even want to say being like clever with your words because that's, um, that's not to imply any kind of deception. There's criticism but, and then there's constructive criticism. Exactly. Criticism. And then there's, and, and there's just, just, I'll say shitting on a product or shit, you know, mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, tearing apart one. I don't know. I'm a big fan of, um, you know, people, if you e are either given something or you, or you buy it outright or whatever, and, and there's, there's nothing. It's the whole reason, like, you're supposed to say, like, this is an ad, right? When you're putting something on, on, on uh, Instagram and you're putting out a product and you're saying, like, if this is an ad or this is a paid advertisement, right? Like, yeah. that's why they're supposed to be, though, you're supposed to adhere to those things so that somebody may know, oh, hey, I was compensated with this, or this is just something that I think. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess to your point, though, yeah, I, I think there's a way of saying certain things are bad or certain ways that I think things can be improved upon. I, I don't have a problem mm -hmm. with that. It's just a matter of, like, how, how, how much of a... A dick do you want to be? Yeah. And, and how, how brutal do you want to be? I mean, you, you should always be honest about it. 
do, do you have to it, be like depends how bad the product disparagingly is, you know, honest but. about it right yeah and i i mean if it's if it's garbage it's garbage and mm-hmm. and maybe you just need to call it what it is or say hey this this is their first this is their i mean he flat out ripped on uh marquez mm-hmm. ripped on a um on a uh, uh, some electric car, and he said the software that's in this car that they kept promising would be updated and updated and updated hasn't been. And right now, this interface and this car, I can't. This is terrible. They need to update this this interface, and that's how he worded it one time. Essentially, with some you know some off brand or newer e- uh, EV car he was reviewing. I can appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, and that and that's funny because that's where I explicitly though did say when I started my video, and I'll tell you guys, I'm not I'm not trying to do a review. I'm kind of trying to give you like a very basic instruction, because I didn't take the time to read what they changed from last year's model to this year's model. I I didn't show you every single pocket and every single zipper. I didn't show you the 13 different angles of how to. See, I didn't stuff every single one of them then with this. This is almost more of a. It's not a review then. Exactly. That's it, why I said this it, is an introduction. This is a yeah, a it's basic a, it's first an take impression of here's what these things are. And I, to me that that was my that that's how I distinguished it. I would not want anyone to consider what I did a review. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't. Yeah. This is a first impression. Yeah, it, it and it does bother me sometimes when you see reviews like day one reviews of a product. Like oh, someone see, Yeah, I got this this morning. Like that's not a review. Like you no, that's you a have first not, impression. Yeah, you have not used that product. You have not like if I were to review a bag, I would want to use it for like two weeks, maybe every day on a course. Or at least a couple of tournament rounds. Yeah. Or yeah. It, it depends on what you think you're gonna be mm-hmm. most accenting and or and or highlighting. Are you trying are you trying to highlight because they're really big on capacity? Or are they trying to highlight mm-hmm. on uh, on accessibility or are they trying to highlight on durability? Because you're right. You, you're not going to get that from one weekend. You're not right. going to know just how durable it is from one weekend. You won't even know how durable it is after two weeks. Like the, exactly. most bags will last at least a few months before they start showing wear. And and if it doesn't, then sure, then you definitely have a durability issue. But you know what is a durable bag? You know I, I've got two bags hanging up right behind the camera there. Um, one of which lasted me 10, 12, 13 years and could still keep going. It's just an old backpack bag. You know, it's it's an old regular bag that we put backpack straps on, and great. You know, it's still working; it's still durable. There's no holes in it. You know, what, so what is the life? What should your bag go? If if I get, you know, I think I'm I'm rolling with a Squatch bag now. How this long? Is not a paid advertisement by Squatch no, or Grip. No, but it should be. So if you guys want to pay us, we you know we'll take your money and we'll say whatever you want. Well, you can. I I I cannot, in good consciousness, review or talk about the Squatch bag. I haven't. I haven't used it. You can. No, I I know. I'm, that's what I'm saying. If they pay you, you can do it. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> um, and and again, I've it it it's it works great. I have a few tiny little complaints I have with it, but sure. I, I would have to literally take it to Twitter. Yeah, take it to Twitter. I'll, I'll take it right to social medias and complain, and you know, bla- put them on blast. Yeah, you can still say that, right? Hot take. Hot hot take. Um, but all, overall, I like the bag. It's 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 good, but. Like, oh, what I was getting at is how long should that bag last me before it wears out? It, do I compare it to a 15 year revolution bag that I had or 10 years? Or it is a modern bag only supposed to last five years? I don't even know, to be honest. And, yeah. and for someone like me that doesn't golf nearly as much as I used to, that revolution bag got a lot of rounds. This Squatch bag that I bought two years ago. Maybe a dozen rounds so far. Yeah, and, and so, so even that saying like, well, it's lasted me two years. Well, it, it's only lasted it's, me twelve rounds. Exactly, and, and it's still in perfect condition. You wouldn't like. It, it, you would hardly even know. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that, so that's it, where th- I think trying to disclose those things and just just yep. being as upfront about some of those things of as course. possible. Well, I've had this for two years. Look at it. It's like, yeah, like you said, you played twelve rounds with it. Uh, how much action did it really see? So anyway, that that that's why I. I I think I specifically said this is not a review. Good. This is more of a first impression unboxing, first impression more than anything about here it is. Um, because I didn't do all the in-depth. And all I thought was, man, yeah, if I want to do an in-depth, like I'm talking multiple angles, I'm talking individual bags, I'm talking about what you know, being familiar with the previous bags to see where the upgrades were. I wasn't about to do all of that. I, oh, hell's no. I, that's not just really the style of my channel. 
Anyway, <clears throat> my revolution bag has a few more decades left in it. Yeah, depending on your, especially depending on your play and frequency, um, mm -hmm. I could see that. Uh, Disc Golf Robot says, let's face it, Terry is most up to date on what the hip kids are well, saying. Well, I, I wouldn't doubt that because you have two teenage I have daughters. Two teenage daughters. So, so who, I, who, whether I want to or not, I hear, yeah. I, I hear a lot of it. Uh, still throwing a sal salient antidote. Antidote. Uh, two, best finesse disc ever. Uh, here's a quick thing I actually learned this weekend. Okay, Terry. Nate Doss said a word this weekend. Nate Doss says words. And I paused, and it wasn't until the next day I had to Google it. And I thought, am I saying it wrong, or is Nate Doss saying it wrong? What? Oh, God. Well, how did, I guess, the how did... Did Nate Doss say this word? Nate Doss said lackadaisical. I think that's wrong. I, I think, think it's, it's right. Really? I thought it was lax a day. So did I. But is it lackadaisical? I, I'm going to look it up again. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I mean, he, 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 he could very well be right. I've always pronounced it lackadaisical. So have I. Like, like not, almost not, LAX. Almost LAX, but probably, it's probably LACS or something. But there's no S there. You're it's right. It's L-A-C-K-A. Lackadaisical. Okay. He's right. I would have been wrong. Lackadaisical. Okay. I'll have to correct myself. I've been wrong all my life. Nothing new one. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of things I've been wrong with. Uh, he said it. I paused. I rem I, well, the camera wasn't on us at the time, but I remember being in the booth. He said it, and I paused. I'm like, did he say that wrong? I wonder if it's regional as to why we say it the way we do. Because you and I both well, said it that way. Well, probably like a lot of words, we heard it that way growing up. Yeah. Same city, same area. Regional. Yeah, yeah maybe regional, but just the fact that... Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's just region, though. Just... Uh, mm. Anyway. Nate is right, Ray says. Yep. We yeah. lack. I, that, all I kept thinking is... <laughs> Oh my God, how many people have screamed at their TV or at their headphones when they've heard me in the few times I've ever said it, but say the word and say it dead wrong, thinking you're such an idiot. I honestly had no idea. And there's, there's the word, especially, which most people just mispronounce, yeah. um, be, be, maybe because they get a little lazy. And then there's lackadaisical, which I just thought was lax. Like, just flat, flat out thought it was Correct. wrong. Correct. Like, I, I there's even almost a difference here in these I two never. Things. I guess I never really thought about it. I just always pronounced it the way I had heard it. And so I had always heard it lackadaisical. And clearly that is incorrect. Anyway, so. Well, good. Now I know. Folks, we're all learning here. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, lack. Bone, bone. Apple tea? I don't think that's... Like Bon Appetit? Uh, I don't think... Pop, soda, or Coke. Th that That's a regional, like... Coke is regional because I think everyone went down in the Atlanta area, Georgia area says Coke because that was the primary soda there, and they have such a huge uh, influence in that area, and, and it obviously went down south. But Pop and Soda... Um, Again, 100% regional. Yeah, like we, us and like... Wisconsin was Pop. Yeah, uh, us Minnesota is Pop. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, and I think, like, Pennsylvania or something dumb. There's, yeah. like, one state that calls it pop, and I I'm, I haven't called it pop in forever. Well, and I, call and it soda, I, and I, don't, I, I officially made the changeover in working at Subway. Mm. I called it, it was pop in our yeah, family had, all of my life. Here. Johnny and I growing up, if, if we were to ever talk, we would have said, hey, you want to pop? That was 100%. However, it yep. got changed when... I worked at Subway, and you would say, "Would you like chips, soda, or cookies?" As as you're checking, you know, someone out and, and working the register. Not chips. And pop. then, yeah, and then forever, it just got changed in my sure. In my, in your, but for the first 14 years of my life, and everyone else, and plenty of people yeah. in in the state, especially in Wisconsin, it was pop. And I wonder then, if they still say pop. I wonder if I if know. You, I don't feel like I hear it anymore. I, I don't. And maybe it's because we're in Milwaukee and, and pop is more regional even to northeastern Wisconsin. Yeah. So it's uh so deep pop. So yeah, that's kind of funny that way. Uh Ray says, Do you like having two Nates in the booth? Gotta be annoying over time. Annoying's not the word I would use. Uh, <laughs> that makes it sound like you're gonna use a worse word or something. No, does it get sometimes congested? 
And, and do I always feel like we need three? And now that's no rip on, on either of them or me. Take me out. Generally speaking, I feel like three feels a tad crowded sometimes. Sometimes. I like, I don't mind three because I feel like it almost forces you guys at times to let it breathe a little bit because you're maybe anticipating somebody else talking. Mm. So, you know, you'll get less of DOS while he's waiting for, um, uh, Sexton to talk or Sexton doesn't talk as much because Doss is going to have a, a thought or you're putting in your, you, you know, your, your 20 cents because, um, cause you're steering the show. I don't mind three. you there are times maybe when it gets a little more exciting that people want to talk more, mm-hmm. but in general, I have, I personally have not noticed too much of a problem with a three person booth. What but, I am happy about, about our three person booth when it does happen is, I, whether or not we have enough silence that, you know, I'm sure plenty could argue that what we don't often do is talk over each other. Uh, that isn't a problem for us and that I can appreciate. Now, do we maybe still talk too much? Sure. But we, we don't have a problem with talking over each other. And that's something I'm really proud of. Uh, and I feel like it's relatively Mm -hmm. natural. We're not, (laughs) I'm not like holding over, (laughs) shut up, shut up. Well, Holding, holding someone's mouth at any point, but we don't talk over each other and that, and that I, I, that much I appreciate. You know, my rule, I've told you this for years. Um, yeah. you should definitely talk 10% less. And when you do that, you're probably still talking 10% too much. Yeah. Uh, that's just in, I think that goes for anybody in the booth. It's not just your booth, Ian and Philo, that same thing. Um, uh, Zoe and, uh, uh, uh JK, everybody, just everybody should talk less a little bit and see how it works. And then at that point, you're still probably talking 10% too much. Yeah, and, it's and, just the way and to it works. your point, almost never will you say, will you see, and now we only have chat for one of the three rounds, almost never have I read this, the phrasing on the chat that's, uh, hey, we need more talking. No, it's no, just, one, no one has ever, I've never gotten that feedback. Could use a little more talking from so-and-so. None of us have ever gotten that feedback. No. So that that's where I agree with you that sometimes it's nice to just sit back and watch what's going on. And, uh, you know, sometimes you feel compelled to talk, but then sometimes you're like, no, I'm just going to sit mm-hmm. You know, If somebody else says something great. And if we don't, let's just enjoy what we're doing. Ray was asking, he was actually meaning that the fact that they're both named Nate, is that ever frustrating or confusing? Oh, that no, it does feel weird sometimes to just say, hey, Doss or hey, Sexton, if I do want to address one of them. But there's there's no smarter Which, way to do it. No, I, I agree. And it's really funny because I, f- and, and granted, my relationship is different with him, but I wouldn't call him Doss to his face. Like, hey, Doss, how you doing? Like, for me, that's he's Nate. But Sexton, I would call him Sexton. Sure. Yeah, you know? Some people are just more... It just... Th- Linked to their last name versus their first. Correct. And it's not that Nate Doss isn't linked to his last name because I, if I were talking about him in the third person, I would probably reference him as Doss. Mm. But if I were talking to him like in a booth, I would probably have to call him Doss just in that scenario. But in general, to me, he's Nate. But Nate Sexton, I would probably say Sexton just because I do not know Nate Sexton nearly as well as I know Nate Doss. And yeah, and to worked be, with them. And to be fair, I I think a lot of people are far more inclined to say, "Hey Sexton," as opposed to, "Hey Nate." Well, at yeah. least okay, maybe not yeah. a lot of people. I am also that mm-hmm. way. Yeah. I am far more but, inclined to ever refer to him as, "Hey, hey Sexton, yeah. are you are you are we going out to dinner tonight?" You know, mm-hmm. after after we you know do the show, I I would say, "Hey Sexton." So if I even if I were looking right at him or or trying to address him, sure goes hand in hand with the names uh jim brown says uh I'll, I'll just say nate queen refuses to be called nate yeah no nathan correct and and i can of course everybody wants to be called what they want to be called by or some people don't care but he has made it very clear that he's nathan not nate and there's uh, uh, that makes perfect sense to me i mean and, it makes sense tonight we talked to tony, tony barella <laughs> yeah it's <a> tony barella <laughs> uh <laughs> what is this we got a Oh, we murder, murder Mike <laughs> coming in from Facebook. Murder, are you the one guy holding down Facebook out there? You're probably the only uh, one watching on that platform, but uh, hope you're doing good. <laughs> Pilcher says, would you call him sexy? Uh, Behind his back. <laughs> Look at that guy. He's sexy. <laughs> yeah. Now, here, which is no. funny, one way that we could, if we really wanted to logistically 
maybe mitigate some of the, the confusion or frustration of the Nate Nate scenario is if I sat in between them. Because then if I turned at any point during the broadcast, well, even if it's off camera, it would be more apparent who I was trying to address. Don't you sit between them? I don't. Oh, I sit on oh. the end now. Oh, okay. I guess I haven't I haven't seen you yeah, guys in you. the booth forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the far uh, right, and then it goes Sexton and then Doss at the end. Oh, no, that last putt drops. I turn that shit right off. I don't want to see you guys. <laughs> I don't want to see you guys. Uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, <laughs> that's how it's gone down. Uh, Terry in the booth with Big D and Sexy. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what that's what we call us, the big D and the sexy. I think we're calling it. Uh, if you don't guys have anything else for us, we are going to call it. We appreciate you guys. Oh, we didn't do a giveaway. Oh, you're right. Patreon.com slash Smashbox TV. Come on. If you want stuff. to sign up at Patreon.com slash Smashbox TV, you will be entered into our weekly giveaway. This week, uh, we have 133. Is that right? I think it's 133 people eligible. I'm looking. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Um, and I sorted it by email address. So Terry Miller, quickly give I me. I would like the, the number, number fifty eight thousand eight hundred eight. That's U.S. dollars to pay a million pesos. So mm, that's not it. I'm well, going to ab's th- ab's one is third. I was going to do three. That's what I was about to say. All right. You so would. our first number is five. Our second number is sixty four. Our third and final number that we generate tonight is nine. nine. Niner, niner, forty niner. So let's go nine to number nine. I don't even have to scroll anywhere. Times. Barney Davis. Congratulations, Barney. Barney Davis. I don't feel like I've sent anything to Barney. Mm. Maybe in a long time. So excited to do so. Yeah. Thank you, Barney. Barney is a, a Patreon supporter at a very high level. Thank you, Barney. Uh, we will get you. We will get you something out of Terry's personal disc golf bag. I'll steal it. Yeah. I'll send it. Yeah, out of my new bag review. Out of his new bag <laughs> my, review. My extensive, in-depth uh, Grip EQ bag reviews. So thank you very much, Barney Davis. Yeah, seriously, we, we do appreciate it. All right, a little over three hours. That's enough from us for this weekend. Enjoy the Music City Open. Johnny nor I are working it, so good luck with it. I uh, hope everybody has a good time. I will be uh, watching... Uh, the National Robotics Championships this weekend where my son's Ooh. team is, oh, is you should competing. should do a companion stream of the live of that <laughs> no. on Smashbox. Uh, uh, maybe. We'll see. No. No. Doubtful. So I'll be watching that and maybe I'll have the Music City open in the background, but I'm going to be more focused on robots throwing rings. It's like a hot date. That is. For Johnny V, I'm Terry Miller, the Disc Golf Guy. That has been Smashbox TV Podcast 502's After Show. Thank you for the love and the support. Thank you to Anthony Barella. Congrats to him again on the Jonesboro win, along with Kristen Tatar from Estonia. We'll see you guys next week. You step inside the Smashbox.